um, turn it around to the um, reverse side, where you see the two great fields of the United States of America. Yep. Okay? Now, if you notice, it says those are supposed to be the two great seals of the United States of America, correct? Yep. Those aren't. Those are the two seals of the Order of the Illuminati. Now, I have all this memorized from my days in the Illuminati. Now, this went on the dollar bill in 1935, but this reflects ancient beliefs of secret societies that go back literally before the birth of Christ. It symbolizes the ancient goal of secret societies of the establishment of what in scripture we see in Revelation 13 is the reign of the beast and the false prophet. See the great seal? It's a very fascinating story. <laughs> I got one right here. Great seal of the United States, or is it the Great Seal of the Illuminati? There's a lot more than meets the eye. over to Sarah and let her go from here. Take it away. Hi, guys. I really miss you. I feel like it's been forever since my last show. When was it, like a month ago? Something like that. Um, Bear with me tonight. I know I look like the walking dead. I have no better term for that. <laughs> it's been a really rough week um, physically and spiritually and I think that's because the enemy knows what a powerful show we are about to have here because God kind of dropped it in my lap like he does everything else in my life. Um, and I love it because it makes it so much easier for me for clarity wise and for presenting it to you guys because I know without a shadow of a doubt this is what he wants you to hear and this is when he wants you to hear it. So, um, you know, you're going to uh, get one of my Sarah stories on how this came to being, this whole lesson started and its inspiration. So I have been reading the Tiny Little Prophets over the past four or five months, and it was Haggai's turn. I we're going to say that Haggai because I have no other pronunciation for it. Um, That's actually the proper pronunciation good i've heard like hey guy and i had an old pastor that used to call it ha the book of hagee <laughs> yeah i've had i've had old pastors pronounce it like that but yeah hi guy is but we're gonna call it hi guy yeah i mean um, that's yeah and i didn't get i'm serious y'all i got 10 verse i mean it's a tiny book it's got what one chapter it's no two chapters it's got two chapters. I got 10 verses in and God said, here it is. And it was such a weird book for me coming from the church, you know, coming from the modern day church to be able to find such an inspiring uh, story and lesson from. Because normally, you know, where do we stick when we're in church? We stick to the very easy things to pull lessons from, you know, love your neighbor do uh, good unto others, things like that, like in the book of Acts or, you know, in the Gospels. That's where it's easy for me to glean from because that's what they focus on so much. There's beautiful lessons there, but I'm learning more and more and more. There's beautiful lessons everywhere. And in this little tiny segment, in a little tiny book, God showed me so much more than I ever knew how much that was true. And that's why um, we're talking about new wineskins. And I know the first thought everyone thinks is um, back to what Jesus said. And we are incorporating that. Why? Because it's all tied together. So first I'm going to read to you um, the verse that we're talking about. It's Haggai 10 and 11. Well, Haggai chapter 1, verse 10 and 11. 
and it says uh this is actually the uh prophet talking to them about how they are being commanded to build god's house basically they were building up their own houses but they kind of they had kind of left god's temple well not kind of they left it in ruins they had finished it they just stopped and this was the prophecy that came through haggai to god's people about what was going to happen because of that the judgment because they hadn't done it um i actually want to start back at verse seven for a little bit of context if you can go ahead and thus says the lord of hosts consider your ways go up to the mountains and bring wood and build the temple that i might take pleasure in it and be glorified says the lord you look for you looked for much but indeed it came to little and when you brought it home i blew it away why says the lord of hosts because of my house that is in ruins while every one of you runs to his own house and this is where we start where god gave me my he gave me my lesson therefore the heavens above you withhold the dew and the earth withholds its fruit for i called for a drought on the land and the mountains on the grain and the new wine and the oil on whatever the ground brings forth on men and livestock and on all the labor of your hands so they they stopped they had started to pack in their riches build their houses super tall and god's temple was in shambles and he was upset rightfully so i mean rightfully so because at the time before we had that segue of jesus that was how he got closest to his people was through that temple and he wants to be with us and they just acted like it didn't matter. And their big houses were what mattered. But when I got to the part where he told them that because of what they had done, he had called for a drought on the mountains, on the grain, and the new wine and the oil, on whatever the ground brings forth, men and livestock, and all the labor of their hands. When I got to the part of the new wine, I went back and remembered that thing that Jesus said which is in the book of Matthew 9:17 and oh I can't pick up my bible today I lost that but maybe we won't need it anymore um Matthew 9:17 um and I'm going to start back at 15 for context and Jesus said to them can the friends of the bridegroom mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them but the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them and then they will fast no one pizza puts a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, for the patch pulls away from the garment and the tear is made worse. Nor do they put new wine into old wineskins, or else the wineskins break. The wine is spilled and the wineskins are ruined, but they put new wine into new wineskins and both are preserved. Now, what do you, what do these two things have to do with each other? Well, at first I didn't know either. Um, I had to do a lot of praying and, um, uh, asking God for some clarity and some guidance and he gave it to me you know diligent prayer and time with him and it was just there it was like it appeared in my mind and I had never downloaded it I don't know if any of you have ever had that experience where he just kind of drops it you don't remember a b or c to get all the way to z and he just gives you z with everything before it and it's it just appears and I started writing and I was filling up pages, and I saw as I was writing how his dots connected. So, they were being punished for leaving the temple in shambles. And because of that, one of the things God did was hold back the new wine. Now, over here we have Jesus talking about not being able to put new wine into old wineskins. Now, we know today that our body is God's temple, okay? We know that we are the temple. We no longer have a physical building. It's each one of God's people. Now, when we do not take the time to do proper renewal of that temple, when we become his people, when we become saved and renewed, and we are grafted into the tree of Israel, and we don't take time to renew that temple, God holds back his new wine from us have you ever heard a christian say i just don't feel like i can hear god i don't feel connected to god i feel there's a distance between us 
He can't put his new wine into your old wineskin. He can't. Why? Because of what Jesus said. The wineskin will burst. It's, I mean, when you think about it, it's, it's merciful. If he tried to fill us up with all his goodness into our old skin, we wouldn't be able to handle it. We wouldn't. But instead, as we slowly renew ourselves, once we are saved and grafted into the tree of Israel, he slowly gets closer to us and gives us more of him. As we put in the front work, we have to put in the work. Okay, I know that's not a modern day church thing like, oh, works are bad. But I'm telling you, he wants us to put in the work. It's going to take some elbow grease. It, and it's not anything you can physically do. It's spiritual elbow grease, for lack of a better term. Um, he wants us to put in that work. Why? Because the more we renew that wineskin, the more he can pour into us. He can pour in his new wine. What is the new wine? I mean, it's everything from the time Jesus appeared until now, guys. I mean... It's happening right now. This is his new wine. Jesus. I mean, I have no other words than to say, why wouldn't anybody, you know, want to as soon as they become saved. But then I remember being there. I remember being brand new in my faith and saying, well, is it still okay to be this way that I was before? And it's like I was I was trying to fit Jesus into what I had already had going on and he didn't want to fit into it he wanted to completely knock it down and rebuild me and if you don't let him that's when you get the people that say I feel that distance why because there is a distance and that's um what brings us to uh second corinthians four sixteen. um this is where you get some clarification on what I'm talking about I'm sorry, my eyes are not working all the way. Uh, 2 Corinthians 4.16 Therefore we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. And that's what I mean. Everyone is so busy on the outward, just like the people in Haggai were. They were building up their houses, but they were leaving God's temple which today, like we are God's temple, they were leaving it in shambles. So God couldn't give them any more of him, and he wants to. Can you imagine how disheartening that could, I mean, that is to him right now. He made us, he created us, he loves us more than anything. And we are trying to put him in the box of our old wineskins that was us before we were grafted in to his tree. We're trying to fit him in there. He can't fit in there. I mean, the Bible says we are as of grasshoppers on the earth, okay? He's so much bigger than our box. Our box that likes to do all the things of the world and be all the things of the world. The minute we get saved, it's not a, it's not a chain. It's not an ultimate, like, everything's right now. But there is a spiritual gumption to want to change if there's not then you didn't get it you said the words but you didn't get it if there is not that 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 flip like of a switch in your spirit the moment it happens that the gumption that says i need more of him how do i do it let me dig into the word let me change then you didn't get it because the minute you taste one little bit of god's goodness all that stuff loses its appeal are you going to struggle yes But it immediately loses its appeal compared to what God is and who he is and what he gives us and how much he loves us. And we are going to work towards building up and renewing our temple every day and making new wineskins for him to pour into. What is he pouring into us? I mean, more of him. He doesn't want to, nor does he have the desire to fit into wineskins that are made up of the world. And we're born into sin. You know, we can't help the old wineskins. But the minute we find him and they're renewed, we can. And he immediately wants to pour into us. And he will start at that very moment. Because you've already renewed yourself so much right then. He will start to pour into you right then. 
but you have to put in the work to keep going or you're going to get stagnant. You're going to get stale and then you're going to feel like God's not talking to you or God's not near you or he doesn't have any interest in what's going on in your life because it will force a disconnect. He doesn't want us to burst like the old wineskins by pouring all his new wine in at once. So to get closer to him, you have to do the work. You have any thoughts before I move to the next big thing where we rapid fire all these verses? Um, <laughs> I I kind of no. like he he didn't know what all this was about, and because we haven't really talked. I well, mean, this is the, kinda, much this, this week. is the longest I've been home all week. This is the longest conversation we've had, not on the phone, and we're not even talking to each other all week, because they moved his route far away and. I've had the kids basically from sun up to sundown by myself and we have another new dog and I love him. I'm just so tired and just like I said spiritual warfare so yeah, it's we're, been a rough we're week. we are reconnecting and renewing uh, right now in front of you because it's been so long. <laughs> but yeah, do and, you have well, any and thoughts? Well, this my is love? Well, like I said the first time we talked about this cuz I mean this has been in the work for what 3 months now. Yeah, it started way back when I got the, I got the drop in my spirit about um, you were forgiving the unforgivable. You on this during forgiving the unforgivable, yeah. and it was already done by the time we were recording more undignified than this. Yeah, it was done. So, and and then, you know, there's a whole section of blue writing had, that God has added, but it I was had, done. I had stuff I wanted to add to it, and honestly, in the time since then, I've, you know, I went on that tangent with last week I did Romans 13. Yeah. And that that was the that is the hardest thing I have ever prepped for. <laughs> um and everything else that was in my brain just flew out to make room for that. Well, just based on what I just said. It's okay. Just any comments, thoughts, suggestions. No, I agree, I, think, I don't agree. I think you're absolutely right. One of the things that I can I can relate to because I was this way and then you know, you see other people that are this way is when people are like, I just don't, I can't read my Bible. I don't want to read my Bible. Oh, when yeah. I do, I don't understand it. Mm -hmm. And I think all of that goes back to this is because you, if God were to give you the, the milk and honey of his word, if you will, yeah, you would burst. Oh, yeah. I mean, my goodness, there's so much there. If I were to try to get the biblical knowledge I have now as a baby, like a, a baby in Christ, I would have run away screaming. Well, see, because here's the thing. So, so uh, yeah, I, I agree with you completely, but I just thought about this. So, what makes wine ferment? Time? Yes, time, but yeast specifically. Oh, yeah. So, it's 11, right? I mean, yeah, natural yeast, let's yes. add... Yes. I am not um, a fan of synthetic yeast. Um, well, <laughs> and that's why you don't have to get rid of it at Passover. It's because right. it's natural. Right. Um, but leaven is one of those things where it represents doctrine because Jesus said, beware you the doctrine of the Pharisees. Mm -hmm. And then it said the disciples were confused because they thought he was talking about bread. <laughs> um, but no, he was talking about doctrine. Right. And one of those things is, is you can't understand proper doctrine because you don't have a new wineskin. That right. proper doctrine will make you burst. Look how many people you tell them before they're ready, and, like, their brain just breaks. Yeah, and it makes them want to run away from God. Why? Because they are made up of old wineskins. They are made up of the wineskin of the world, and the world, when it hears the stuff that God's got going on, it wants to run and hide because it knows it's what's in trouble. Right. So that's why... You hear people say, well, God seems mean or God seems scary. It's because you have the wineskin of the world and that stuff is scary to the world, to the evil people who know what their destiny is. Well, it's so interesting. Um, well, I, I don't know what this has to do with it, but you know, okay. it talks about it talks about being scared and it's because there's two defaults. Mm -hmm. If you don't serve Christ, you serve the devil. We just talked about this in the weekend news bulletin earlier sure. today. Um, you mean like 10 minutes ago? Yeah, for me it was 10 <laughs> minutes ago. For everybody else it was four and a half hours ago. Yeah, 
um, like almost five hours travel. ago now. So, um, but you know, there's that Bible verse: "Resist the devil, and he will flee from you." Yeah. So there's a story in the book of Jasher, and it's I when Abraham is taking Isaac to present him as an offering. Right. The devil comes, mm-hmm. and he presents himself as an old man to mm-hmm. Isaac or to Abraham rather. And was like, wh- you know, why are you doing this? People are going to think you're crazy. You know, um, they're, they're I've not going to understand it. Uh, you know, you just really shouldn't do this. And Ab- Abraham was basically like, look, I know it's you, Satan. You know, get behind me. And so then he changes form again and comes as a young man to Isaac and is like, you know, man, yeah, has your dad, like, has he lost it? What's going on? Like, um, and this is the worst paraphrase in the world, but the general point is there because Isaac says, Dad, you know, there's this guy. He's talking about this, and Abraham's like, yeah, Isaac, that's Satan. Just don't listen to him. So then Satan gets really desperate. So he turns into a river that crosses the road, and as they're crossing, Abraham gets neck deep in the water and then starts looking around and goes, wait a second. There's not a river here. <laughs> It's like, all right, Satan, I know this is you again. And it says, and the devil feared and fled before them. Mm. Because, because here's the thing. So, and I think this is where it connects full circle. Maybe this is me trying too hard to connect the two. But Abraham always had room for everything that God revealed to him. Mm -hmm. Even to the point where he was willing to take his son up on an altar because he knew that, quote, God would provide a lamb. Mm-hmm. Right? Now, of course, he provides a ram in the story. We know who the lamb actually is. Yeah. But, I mean, good goodness gracious, how new does your wineskin have to be to understand that thousands of years ahead of you, God would send his son? Mm-hmm. Because Abraham got it. And see, but, I mean. But look what it did. It, it, it scared the people around him. Mm-hmm. And the devil manifested and used that. And the devil wanted really to stop are some that because gems in the book of Jasher. Oh, yeah, the devil wanted to stop that encounter because that is when God knew that Abraham loved him unconditionally and made that covenant to make his and his descendants more numerous than the sand of the sea. Yeah, and well, he knew what a powerhouse would come through it, which was Jesus. Mm-hmm. I mean, of course he would want to stop that encounter, but Abraham trusted in the plan even when he didn't have all the details he was renewed in god enough to know i gotta do it i gotta do what he says and i know he'll provide but no that wasn't trying too hard that fit perfectly my love um i mean when you think about where you started your journey when you became saved i mean some of us you know we were kids you know, I remember my grandma dragging me to the front of the church as a five or six year old. I was really little. I was at church. I used to go to church with my grandma almost every Sunday. Um, but she dragged me to the front of the church when they had the altar call and told me what to do. And I said the words. And I was like, okay, what do I do now? And it didn't really, nothing really stuck. Not, I mean, like, I said the words, I said the motion, and, you know, based on what I had been told, when you stood up, it, you were all good. I mean, that was it. That's all you had to do. The rest would just, like, flow into you. And there wasn't really any more work to be done. There was just diligence, you know. But I was really little. I mean, and I didn't have any guidance. You know, my mother wasn't a God-fearing woman at the time. And my grandma, you know, she... She was an influence in my life, but, you know, she wasn't, like, a permanent one because as, you know, we moved around and stuff, I would see her, I wouldn't see her. So it was, I was kind of on an island, and I didn't know what to do with that. And then when I turned 13 and we switched churches, we had been going to a little Baptist church, uh, but my mom finally decided, you know, to jump in head first into the faith thing, and we switched churches and, you know, I found a youth group and I finally felt like I had a job. You know, how I'm, how many of us feel purposeless sometimes in our walk with God? Like, I know he has a purpose for me, but because I don't know what it is, I feel purposeless. But when you have a job, when you clearly see the path he wants you to take, that, that umption it gives you to just 
conquer the world in a night. You know, you do all the things. You set up the fundraisers and 5K walks to raise money for orphans and widows. Like, you can do all the things when you finally have your calling, whether it's the homeless, whether it's um, children overseas, you know, whether it's uh, shut-ins or the sick. When you finally know that specific niche he called you for, you say, okay, let's go. Let's go. I got this. And at 13, I hit that niche. I finally figured out where I was supposed to be serving at the moment. But I was still spiritually a baby. Because I didn't know a lot of anything. But I just did as God asked. You know, I, I felt him near me. I could hear him talking to me clearly. Not as clearly as I can today. But it's been, you know, 13 years since then that I've had to work on this relationship between me and him. Um, I could hear him speaking, and I did what he asked. And I grew as a person. I grew in my faith, and I grew in the ministry that I was operating inside. You know, I could feel lives being changed. I could feel as I would lead people, you know, uh, to the beauty that is his message and his love and his mercy. I could feel the change in them. So I knew I was doing a good work. But then, because I wasn't disciplined in knowing how to grow myself, you know, I was growing in all these ways. And while I was growing as a person and in my faith, I wasn't putting in the elbow grease spiritually to grow in who he wanted me to be. Because no one had ever taught me, you know, what? So get this. So I was just curious. So okay. I went to Haggai 1, uh -huh. and I wanted to read the notes that I had from Spurgeon on that. And this is what he says about verse 7 and 8, Okay, which I'm just going to read again just so yeah, we've do it. got that. Refresher. So, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways, go up to the mountain and bring wood and build the house, and I will take pleasure in it. I will be glorified, saith the Lord. And this is what Spurgeon says. That is the great objective we should aim at in all we do. That God may be glorified, that God may take, may take pleasure in it. It does not matter whom we please if God is not pleased or who gets honor from what we give if God is not glorified as a result. That is beautiful. That is just beautiful. And, I mean, that's, that's what it's all about. But it goes back even farther mm -hmm. because everybody, just about everybody that we hear this from, Everybody that we hear say that I just don't feel like I'm hearing from God. Mm -hmm. They're either in a new apostolic reformation church, which puts more, uh, puts more uh, in stock into feelings than doctrine. Mm -hmm. Or we're hearing it from people who are a seeker-friendly movement who are aiming to please those who come in. And then they lose sight of the fact that that's not who they're supposed to be pleasing. Right. They want so bad for the world to like them. Or to they put want on a so good show for the people paying them their money. They want so bad to get high on Jesus. Oh, yeah. That they don't realize that they're making it about them either pleasing themselves or pleasing others. Mm -hmm. It's great to please others. As long as you're doing it not to please them but to glorify them. If they get pleased along the way, then, you know, hallelujah. Yeah. But... It just, I, but you're I don't gonna know. make some you people mad. But you don't hear preaching like this anymore. You really don't, because and I mean, this is not just like commentary. This is actually from a sermon that Charles Spurgeon preached out of Habakkuk or out of Haggai one. So, I mean, you don't. I mean, when you go into the church, I mean, you sit down. I say I mean a lot, and I just realized that. Sorry. I say here's the thing. So. Oh gosh, I know you say it all the time. Here's the thing about why I didn't do the dishes. Hey, uh, you know, did Meredith get her homework done today? Here's the thing. Actually, I never give an excuse for why I didn't do the dishes. They just don't get done sometimes. Yeah. Believe me, I know. He's a work in progress. He's putting in his spiritual elbow grease as a husband, and I appreciate that. He's working towards a better hey, goal of empty sinks for his wife. You can't do the dishes if you're not home. Uh, I was talking about the time you were home and I had to go see my client and I was like, can you do this, this, and this? And I came home and you were like, here's the thing. We didn't get any of that done. <laughs> oh, yeah, there was that time. But hey. That time. There were, the girls were happy. 
the girls were happy, so I can let go and, of a lot and, of other stuff. And I did all the laundry that night. Yeah. Oh, gosh. That was a big help. See? So, I can, I can give and take. There's an ebb and flow. But, you know, when I've been, you know, lifting on pregnant women all evening and be like, okay, let's, let's, these are the positions for labor and I have to move them and I'm tired. My back hurts. I love what I do and it is physically demanding and I love that because it keeps me sharp and it keeps me using this beautiful temple that God gave me. I'm using it for his glory because I'm teaching women how to have beautiful labors like what they did back in the olden days of the Bible, like God intended, because the way he designed our bodies to have babies works. Sometimes, you know, we do need doctor intervention, but we shouldn't start out that way. You know, we should start out full force. And then the knowledge that God gave the doctors and the people to learn should step in when it needs to. Yeah. Well, not see, because it's there. That's the two extremes, right? You got to go to a doctor for everything or go to a doctor for nothing. Yeah. But they they the think there's no in between. God gave us the stuff that we need in nature to take care of a lot of our stuff. But here's mm -hmm. the other reality. The gospel of Luke was written by a doctor. Mm hmm. Mic drop. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that's what I do is I teach people that the doctors, you know, being able to help you is a beautiful thing, but it shouldn't start that way. Like if they don't like the timeline of your birth and they just step in and take over and do all these things to you, which then stress out the baby. So then they have to do more things to you, which then stresses out the mom. So they have to do more things, you know, when they see a sign, they should jump in and help then. Otherwise, hands off. But that's what I do. That was a rant of some... Well, I, I was going to spin that around. Well, no, because you make an excellent point because there's a kind of a parallel between the doctor and you in that scenario where the doctors try to get too involved mm -hmm. and they screw everything up. Yeah, Which can be the same with you or I if there's times where God wants us to act. But if we're acting at the times he doesn't want us to act and we're jumping in, we're going to screw it up. Oh, yeah, because that's where it goes back to spiritual discipline. If we're not in his word and constantly renewing our temples, which we're going to get to on how to do in just a moment. If we're not constantly doing that, we can't hear his voice. We don't know what he wants us to do. And we jump in and we screw some stuff up. Like people who say, I just want to start this brand new ministry and they haven't... Uh, they haven't done any praying. They haven't done any fasting. You know, they haven't put in the elbow grease of, you know, let me you know, save up some of my own money instead of relying on pulling out of tithes for this ministry. Put in some of my, you know, blood, sweat, and tears for this. Because works are bad, you know? I mean, we're it's drilled into us. Works are bad. If God wants it to happen, he will do everything. That No. Oh, gosh. It okay. kind of goes back to the... Okay. You got to let go and let God. Oh, that's such a cop-out. Are you okay? Uh, Here it is. It was something I was reading this morning when I just said that statement. He said, okay, read that now. That's why I told you that thing this morning. Um, Not in those words, but that's basically what he just said. Yeah, because you just, like, went Joe Biden on that. You know the <laughs> thing. Come on, man. The thing. Um... It was just like one of those things he just dropped it in and said, remember what we talked about this morning? Okay, Zechariah um, uh, is chapter 9, verses 11 through 13. Uh, As for you also, because of the blood of your covenant, I will set your prisoners free from the waterless pit. Return to the stronghold, you prisoners of hope. Even today I declare that I will restore double to you, for I have bent Judah my bow, fitted the bow with a frame, and raised up your sons, O Zion, against your sons, O Greece, and made you like the sword of a mighty man. And I was like, wow, that's so interesting. You know, God is coming to save his people, but he doesn't say how. And there's a reason he doesn't give the specifics on how. Because the work part of that is up to the people. He's saying that he is bending Judah like a bow and fitted the bow with a frame. And he is making his sons, his people, like the sword of a mighty man. He gives no other details other than that. Why? Because he is requiring work from them in order to fulfill that promise he just made. They have to hold up their end. 
Have you ever seen a covenant he made where there wasn't work on the part of the people? I mean, look at the. Okay, I'll follow where you say go. In Genesis. God, I don't even know where it is. Please help me. It's um, it's when Jacob sleeps on that rock. That is Genesis 34? No, nope, that's Dinah. Gotcha, so it's a little bit before that. Try Genesis 30. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Okay. Oh, gosh. Um... I don't know. See if you can find it for me and I'll read it. Wait a minute. That's wrestling with God when he blesses him. It's a covenant that Jacob makes with God. And he He's says... talking about at the ladder? And Jacob <laughs> went out from Beersheba and went toward Haran. And he lighted He's up a certain place and tarried there all night because the sun was set. And he took of the stones of that place and put them for his pillows. I found it. And lay down in that place to sleep. It's Genesis 28, verse 10. Yep, that's where I am. Uh, then Jacob made a vow saying, If God will be with me and keep me in this way that I am going and give me bread to eat and clothing to put on so that I come back to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God. And the stone which I have set as a pillar shall be God's house. And all of that you give me, I will surely give a tenth to you. This is and the reason. What? And that was that was Bethel, right? Uh -huh. That was where. So you were right. Right. So here's what's funny, and I told you this, uh -huh. but I have two Bethels on my route. There are three Bethels <laughs> in North Carolina. I run two of them. See, I told you God didn't put you up there by accident. There's work to be done. Yeah, absolutely. Um, because you can tell that story in a minute if you want to, um, because that's a big renewing thing that we're gonna go over about how renewing our house is part of renewal, and that oh, yeah, that yeah, part yeah, wasn't yeah, renewed. Yeah, you know yeah, where yeah, I'm going. Yeah, yeah. I'm not gonna give all the details, but. He made this vow, and do you realize that that is the reason that when he gave Moses the law, that it says give one-tenth? Because we are under Jacob's covenant with God. We are under that. Why? Because what did his name get changed to? Israel. Who are we? Well, I'm Trey. You're Sarah. Who are we? We're the Israel of God. Exactly. We are under this covenant. That's why God says he'll always provide. You know what I wanted. You're just <laughs> baiting me. Okay. When I say, I mean, it's like when they say, you know, when I say, um, oh gosh, I can't think of an example. Like the cheerleaders at the game. When I say this, you say that. And the audience just, just does it. That's what you needed to be right then. You needed to be my hype man. Okay. I'm not a good hype man. You, you'll you'll learn. I, I'm too um, monotone. Because God is telling me to go all over the places, and you just gonna have to give the answers. Because if I just say everything, they're gonna get bored. Mm, no, I promise you, they 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 look forward. Why to am, your am show. I funny looking? Is yeah. that why they're entertained by my show? Yeah. I know I'm funny looking tonight because I probably look like I haven't slept in a while. We are under this <laughs> promise, this covenant. That's why when Moses is given the law and it says, give one-tenth to me, he is commanding that to them because well, we are under there, the promise of Jacob. There's a nuance to that too, though. I mean, there's always because a nuance. he chooses to take his tenth through the Levites, right? Right. But he, they screwed it up and he was like, all right, yeah, y'all are done. Exactly. So. But, I mean, this is, this is where it comes from. Right, yeah, this. that's where the Levitical the Levitical tithe came from. Exactly. I have to clarify that because there are people that tune into the channel sometimes that are still involved in Sunday church. That's and fine. We're all growing. No, but that's what I'm saying is I want to point out that the, the tithe that people are using, they take the tenth from the people in the congregation and then they use it to pay for the lights and right. pay the pastor's salary. Right. That's completely unbiblical. Completely unbiblical. And most of our listeners know that, but I do want to clarify for those who might tune in that haven't heard that. Yeah. Um, because, I mean, that light bill being paid, you could have church in the dark. You sure could. It wouldn't be comfortable, but you could do it. And then they could use that money to do something for the kingdom. And here's the way. You know how you know you could do that <laughs> without paying the light bill? Because, because they didn't they have did lights. they did it for hundreds of years and without lights. Mm -hmm. 
air. You know, there's churches overseas that still got dirt floors and don't have walls. They just meet in the middle of the fields because they crave God that much. Do you churches crave in God China enough? Don't even, they don't even send out memos. They literally trust the Holy Spirit to lead them to wherever they're mm-hmm. going to be because they can't afford to send out memos because yeah. the CCP will come raid and kill everybody. I know, God. Uh, yeah, here the American church is talking about you need to get uh, let, let let's put let's do Kenneth Copeland for an example. Yep, right because on. during the lockdown he was talking about that and he said, "Don't you dare quit tithing." You know the when man. When people the man, are struggling, the man, the man that bought Tyler Perry's jet because Tyler Perry made that plane so cheap, I had to buy it. Yeah, cheap. That would pay for the rest of it was my a, life. It was eleven million dollars. The rest of our whole lives, yeah. plus six other people. Eleven million I can dollars, live so cheap, super comfortably off. There's that. another story he told of his first plane he bought, and um, the guy said, "Is that God's plane?" He said, "No, this is my plane. The Lord gave it, but this is my plane." Mm-hmm. So, I uh, that's just that's my Kenneth Copeland rant because I just ugh. Oh man, there's there's mm-hmm. there's so many people that make me mad mm-hmm. because of the blasphemy. That they like every preacher proclaim. I was forced to watch on TV as a child. Forced. We're not gonna get into that today. We're gonna leave Sarah's. I know one of them was the Filipino past. Johnny Bravo. You talking about Joseph Prince? Joseph Prince. <laughs> Joseph Prince. He did one good teaching that I loved about Revelation. He had pictures, man. I mean, he was diving deep. It was great. And then the rest of it, like I kept trying to watch him because that one was so good. I was like. A what is he dog, talking about? A lost dog will every now and then find their way home. And a broken clock is right twice a day. Yeah. I mean, like, I've he- heard pastors that only preach the feel goodness, and then one day they walk into church. What? This whole desk just shifted. That was weird. Is it Piper? No, it was my foot. Piper. Oh. It's our cat. She's actually more of, like, a lioness. She doesn't yeah. know she's a cat. She thinks she's, like, super. And she is. I mean, she keeps all the rodents away. She kills For the most part. She kills snakes in the yard, which makes me sad because they're really good snakes. Yeah. But yeah, she's I killing, still love her. She's killing the good snakes. But I will say this: something's keeping away the venomous snakes because we have a really high count of copperheads in Edgecombe County. Oh yeah, super high. But she goes out in them woods and they see her and they run. Why? Because she's a lioness. I love her. Um, we adopted her. Adopt your pets. Adopt, don't buy. That's my drop for that. Where was I going with this? Stop, don't say anything, because I'm going to lose it. Tithing. Um, Don't dare quit tithing. Okay, so first of all, don't dare quit tithing. He is exactly right. Even when you are out of a job and you are living on the streets, don't you dare quit tithing. You know what that means? That means if somebody gives you some food, you give one-tenth of it to the next person who's hungry. That is your tithe. Don't dare quit doing that. When you got nothing, you slice off a little bit of your nothing and you pass it on to the next person in need. There is always somebody in more need than you. But don't you dare think that you do not belong in the doors of what claims to be God's house because you don't got money to put in that plate. Well, and and that goes back to Jesus said, you know, when you've done this to the least of these, you've you've done done it unto me. me. Yeah. I mean, like, I've told this story before, but my grandma went to Honduras on a mission trip years and years and years ago when I was little. Like um, Brenda? Yeah. She went on a mission trip to her Honduras, and let me tell you... I could not picture her in Honduras. Let me tell you, she rocked it. I mean, the, the, oh, I the people it. of her church came back and were telling the stories. And, of course, you know, she was telling the stories because she loves life experience. Well, loves it. She loves to tell stories. Yeah. And she really, I mean, she loves people. Loves yeah, she people. Does. Yeah, she does. So, and I mean, I've told this story before, but I'm gonna tell it again because some of y'all might not have watched that show. Um, she went to Honduras, and my grandma. Okay, she has nothing. She is illegal. Uh, been blind since birth. She was born in a tobacco field, and her mama was trying to hold her in, and accidentally, you know, made her blind. Her whole life, she's been blind. Got picked on and ridiculed in school. Never been able to drive. Never been able to have a job. She's been on disability, dependent on others all her life. She has next to nothing. Okay. Like literally would have to go to the pharmacy and pull a little red wagon so she would have something. 
Yeah. She walks everywhere and she would pull a little red wagon so she could have all her prescriptions for the pharmacy to refill. And she would go there and do the blood pressure cuff for free when she couldn't afford to go to the doctor and make sure her blood pressure wasn't out of whack. I mean, nothing. Everything she has, you know, she tells you, I'm dependent on God for. But she had brought, she was wearing shoes, you know, obviously, because the Honduras sand is like 3,000 degrees. And all these little kids running up to them and they were sharing water and, you know, talking to them and passing out snacks. And one of the girls ran up to my grandma and had no shoes on. Honduras sand, hot, okay? My grandma took these shoes off of her feet and gave them to her and walked barefoot the rest of the day until she got back and she had one more pair of flip-flops for the rest of the trip. She gave her the shoes off her feet, okay? Had almost nothing. Yeah, so I think, and and I I think... That's you. Grab that. She. Grab her. You need to hurry up. (laughs) Why are you waiting? No, grab that situation is what I mean. Like, uh, sorry, I'm probably being too loud for the 14 month old. Um, but don't you dare quit tithing. Don't you dare quit tithing. You give a slice of whatever you got, even if all you have is a place to sleep under a tent, and somebody next to you is getting rained on. Make a little room, okay? You know, I was just the other day, and this is not to toot my own horn because this is what we're supposed to do, but it's just an example for those of you. Um, I had a friend over. She's a client, and she's a friend, um, and having a play date and, you know, working out issues with the new baby and all, helping her out. And I was baking bread. I love to bake my own bread. I have a rare, well, I can't even say it's rare, an extremely common, over 70% of people have uh, have it, genetic mutation where I can't digest synthetic folic acid it's bad for my body and if you don't know anything about folic acid synthetic folic acid it's in almost everything including all breads that aren't six dollars a loaf and I'm not spending that I bake my own bread um I was baking bread and she's really interested in you know starting to be more self-sufficient because she sees the way the world is going she wants a little less dependency on the grocery store and she was like well um you know I wonder you know how the bread tastes and you know how do you make it do you think you could teach me these things so I baked three loaves of bread that day and the one that rose the most beautifully and the crust browned perfectly and it was nice and robust just a beautiful loaf of bread I bagged it up sent it home with her because it was the best of what I had the very best of what I had to give and it was a portion of it no, I didn't give her all my bread. You know, you have to right. save some for you. Yeah, so that was what I was going to say before I walked away is it's so because, you know, the the widow with her mites, right? Yeah. You know, she didn't give 10% exactly. Her money mites, not actual mites. Yeah. You're talking about the story in the Bible. Okay. Yeah. I'm there now. <laughs> yeah. Got some dust mites. Um, I think I've slept <laughs> 10 hours all week. I'm here. Um, but you know, she gave what she had yeah, and she gave it willingly and cheerfully. And that's the thing. Like if you're going out and well, you know, I reckon I got to, I, you know, here's, here's 10%. Like I got a hundred eggs. Here's 10 of them. And uh, mm, and like, if you're just doing it to do it, you've, you've completely missed the point. Yeah. And you know. We know that most of you guys know this. Like, we're preaching to the choir here. But, because I believe it's 1 Corinthians, isn't it 1 Corinthians 16? That talks about being a cheerful giver. Because I'm right here in the Corinthians, so I could tell you. But I know Paul talks over and over again about being a cheerful giver. He talks about it, and that's one of the things he commends the Philippians for. In chapter 2 of the book of Philippians as well, I believe. Might be chapter one. That's about collection for the saints. On the first day of the week, let each one of you lay something aside, storing up as he may prosper, that there be no collections when I come. Yeah, so see what's interesting about that is that goes back to, I believe, is it it in Malachi or is it in Micah where it talks about the, they, they stored the tithes of their grain? Malachi, because that's the book where basically everything Haggai said, Malachi had to re say it because they didn't listen. Yeah, so. But that that, that kind of goes to that, is you're putting something aside. It doesn't have to be 
ten percent necessarily, mm -hmm. but the the tenth was a common thing because it wasn't just Jacob that did it. Abraham did it for Melchizedek as well. Well, I mean, and see, even I've been ridiculed in tour groups about that. Like people asked a question one time, "How do you tithe from your garden?" And I said, "You know, I like to have specific tithe plants. I take one tenth of my plants. So if I were to plant ten plants." One plant, the nice, biggest, beautifulest, healthiest, whatever grows on that plant is what I give to other people. And they were like, well, I don't do that. I don't like to put limits on it. And I just feel like that's not enough. And I give as God tells me to give. But God told me to give a tenth. What's wrong with that? If I feel like giving more and somebody's in need, I give more because God will, you know, turn around. He will provide for me yeah, if and I'm listening. And see, that's the well, biggest. Why are you ridiculing me? I mean. It, I well, and it goes back. It goes back to t the two things because it goes back to the all or nothing thing. Which yeah. I know that's a big shot to hear from me because that's my become my most common. He accusation. has two speeds: zero and one hundred. There is no sixty-seven. There's no forty-eight. There's zero and there's one hundred. Sixty-seven and forty-eight are the most random numbers. <laughs> because when have I ever colored um, inside the lines? Ever. So you're all or nothing as well, then? No, I'm literally the exact opposite of that. Because you would say, either I color that picture perfectly or I'm not coloring it at all. And I'm going to color all over the daggone picture. That's why we bump heads so uh, hard sometimes. But you're wrong. I cheat the system. I draw my own picture. <laughs> <laughs> um, but so it goes back to that all or nothing. Well, the church, they ask for the tithes, but they're not the Levites. So they can't biblically ask for that. Right. But it goes to the same thing because people also forget that you were supposed to tithe for the widow and the orphan. Mm -hmm. who are still around. James tells us that true religion, pure and undefiled, is taking care of the widow and the orphan. So I would just say, giving, looking at that through a whole Bible lens, that the tenth for the widow and the orphan still applies. Oh, and we yeah. know that, so now you see TV every time around this. As a matter of fact, they're doing it right now. They collect money for the widows. Oh, yeah. That's awesome. Um, but, you know, so there, there is that. It's not all or nothing. And, yes, there's nothing wrong with giving the way God tells you to give. But God did give you a minimum number. Yeah, like, I just want to ensure I'm giving my minimum. I give more if I need to. But see, they acted like they were better than me because they didn't pick out a plant. I mean, I was just trying to make it eat. Mathematically, I'm a quantifier well, okay. and, and I'm not Numbers. I'm not trying to condemn anybody, but I mean, my instinct. They just made me feel bad, and like I felt like the, that's the opposite. The reality of what they is, is do. at least at least one of those persons statistically mm -hmm. was saying that because they hadn't put the time into studying those passages, and it caught them off guard. Right. Um, but I want to go ahead and move on to our next segment because we talked so much about renewing, and now I'm going to show you what the Bible says on how to renew. Um, we are given specific instructions throughout the Bible on how to renew our mind, our strength, our soul, and our heart. All the things that God says love him with. Love him with all of those. And how do you do that? You have to renew them first. They can't be totally committed to him, those parts of you, until you are out of your old wineskins, you are in your new wineskins, and you are working every day, like it says in Second Corinthians, because that, oh, that outward man is perishable, but that inward man is perishing, and that inward man is being renewed day by day. It's a process. It's not one day. It's day by day. And there's all these different parts. You can either work on them collectively or one at a time or, you know, as God gives you the urging. But here are the verses on how to do them. If you want to follow me, this is going to be a lot, okay? That's all right. Oh, rapid no. fire, and then just. But I am me, reading them. But it let is me rapid see fire. them um, when I upload the video, and you'll put them in the thing, and I'll put them in the description. Okay, so first we're going to start on renewing the mind. Okay, when you first become saved, your mind is your biggest, second biggest enemy against doing what God wants you to do. I say second biggest because the body can be a big one, especially, like, for men, because I know, like, there's, like, temptations that they struggle with that I know some women understand, but, like, I guess it's just me, personally. Like, like sexual things, like, their body just kind of urges them that way before their mind can even react. Like, you know what I'm, you understand what I'm saying, honey? 
Yeah. Like you see a beautiful woman and immediately like your body reacts before your mind has even processed what just happened. Mm -hmm. So that's why I say it could be your second biggest, but it's, it's one of the biggest enemies against God's plan for you is your mind inside your old wine skin. Um, and the first verse I want to go to is Romans 12, two, it says, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And the way you prove it is by the renewal. There's more verses under mind, but while we were, no, actually I'm going to read the next one and then I'm going to say what I was about to say. Um, I'm singing the Bible song in my head because I don't remember where the book is. Philippians 4, 8. 4, 8. Finally, brethren, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. That is the biggest key on renewing your mind, mind skin. <laughs> you're, you're, sorry, your mind. <laughs> I, I was going to get through this show without doing that. It's big brain time. <laughs> Your, <laughs> your mind, your, I can't even say it. Your mind skin. <laughs> I'm so tired. Oh gosh. I'm so tired. Oh goodness. Give me grace, please. Renew your mind skin and find grace in there for me. <laughs> this is the biggest key on how to, do, on how to do that. Um, Renew your mind wine skin is what was trying to come out, but my <laughs> mind skin. That's going to be a t-shirt. Renew your mind skin. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, goodness. I'm not making you any more t-shirts if you're going to make fun of my mind skin. Um, that is how you renew your mind, okay? You have to only meditate on the things that are noble, true, pure, just, lovely, of good report, of virtue, anything praiseworthy. You meditate on those things. And, you know, when we say meditate, we're not talking about, you know, as in like Buddhism meditate. And I clarify that for any people who don't know what the Bible may mean by meditate because you've only seen meditate one way where they cross their legs and they do their fingers and they're doing the alms. And I'm sure that's some spiritual hunky junky. I don't want. <laughs> I means, don't want anything to do Hebrew, with. In Hebrew, in Hebrew, om means light. So they're, they're trying. Oh, they're seeking illumination. Illumination. I get it. Um, but no, that's not what it means. So when you meditate on something, have you ever been in your car and you're driving and you're having those thoughts in your brain, but no words are coming out, and you're, it's like you're talking to yourself inside your mind? I'm sure I'm not the only one. Please tell me in the comments. I'm not alone. Um, or in the chat, whatever. Uh, that is meditation. You are wondering why you always stare off into the distance blankly. When I you am drive. thinking so deeply when I drive. I am turning things over and I am twisting them inside out and I am ripping the sides of boxes off of them hey, so that they can expand. And I'm you, like, you what can't are the things? Possibly have any deep thoughts that were as deep as what I said the last time we did a show together. What? That us and the trees feed each other. <laughs> They do. We do. We, we do. do. Uh, that's a t-shirt. Feed the trees. Don't blow hot air. Feed the trees. <laughs> they like. They look good. Clean oxygen, not full of hot air. Um, I'm, oxygen, CO two for the trees. Yeah, not they oxygen. need to renew their mind skin. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> Stay all the way over there. Don't talk to me, tree man. Okay. Mind skin is a thing. I'm sure there's skin on it somewhere. Yeah, it's called anybody, your brain. Anybody, your neurologist, can you tell me, is there like a film outside your brain that we can call a mind skin now so I can redeem myself? Um, What is it? It's like, it's one o'clock in the morning. Yeah. It's one seventeen. I know. I just looked at my phone. I was rounding. 
Okay. But this is the biggest way to do that. Meditate on those things. So when you're driving and you're turning those thoughts over and over and over, that's the meditation the Bible is talking about. You think on it repeatedly from all the angles. You twist it and yeah. turn it sideways, so upside down. It literally, the all word the, the word means to mutter. Hmm. So you mutter it like that's interesting. Whatever it's just. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, so. pick that, pick a verse, okay? Like I picked that verse from Haggai, which really, I mean, God just kind of dropped it on me. But like, take that verse, and if something kind of sticks at you, like, hmm, that sounds interesting. Like, I wonder what he means by that. Twist it and turn it sideways, upside down. Go into your phone and you know look up verses that say this phrase. Compare it with other ones that say the same thing, and then you can. That that's how you meditate and how you study. That is how you renew your mind. The more you think on the things of God, the less time there is for the old stuff. Um, the next verse I want to go to is in the very neighboring book in Colossians. Colossians three two says, "Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth." Super simple, but it's another way we renew our mind. Um, when you're thinking about heaven. When you're thinking about God up there in his plan, the earth and its problems seem so small. Like, especially it, even what's going on right now. We know the world is chaotic right now. But we also know God has a plan. I just saw a light come on. Oh, the screen changed. Um, we also know God has a plan. When we, were, when we are affixed mentally on his plan, instead of what's going on, it doesn't seem scary. It doesn't seem... Like we should have pause because we know when it's time God will tuck us under his wing in the secret place. Um, because it is his will that none will perish. Will some perish? Yes. But they get to go right with him. And so when you think about that, I mean, you think even if, you know, I don't make it all the way to the end of, you know, Jesus coming back to earth before I die and I, I'm up in heaven. It's okay because I'm with him. That's what matters. I am with him. Um, yeah, go rewrap her up and get that blanket away from her face that Meredith just moved onto her. <sighs> Told you we should have moved the big ones back to their bed first, but Meredith is a tosser turner. She doesn't stay very long where she's supposed to be. Um, but when you set your mind on those things, the world and its problems don't seem so scary anymore and I know that's hard because I'm, I'm a person with anxiety I struggle with it all the time even though I am renewing my mind daily I still have moments and things that hit me and I struggle with you know bills don't really get to me anymore money doesn't really get to me anymore because I've seen God's provision when we have little and I've seen God's provision when we have much yeah. Okay. So let me tell you about the throes of anxiety. If nobody knows how bad it is. When I was pregnant with Meredith, um, I had some problems in early on in my pregnancy that I had to go to the ER for a couple of times and I didn't have any insurance. I had just lost my insurance, um, right before we got married and, you know, we couldn't afford to put me on his insurance because it was more than, you know, our entire rent payment at the time when we were in a little well it was a big apartment which is saying something because i worked for the u.s government at that point yeah well, um local government but still but i remember being hugely pregnant and the bill finally came in from early in my pregnancy for what i owed the hospital and i was like oh my gosh how do i pay this and i was like i don't know how i pay it so i was sending off like tiny little amounts to it just like just just enough to say hey I didn't forget about you, but I, because anxiety is a thing and it eats at you and it's not logical, which is what something my husband doesn't understand. It doesn't, it's not logical with anxiety. It literally makes no sense and you know, it makes no sense. And because you know, it makes no sense. It makes you feel crazy, which gives you anxiety that you might be crazy. I've been there. I would lay in the bed for hours next to him because he was on night shift he would sleep all day and I didn't have a job at the time I had quit my job um to get ready for the baby and be home with her and she unwrapped the baby again to be home with uh the baby and get ready for that because I was having 
trouble in my pregnancy um i was home so he would be asleep you know ready to go to work at seven o'clock that night and instead of you know living life i would lay next to him all day and worry every time i heard a door close outside every time i heard vehicles come that they were coming to haul me away to debtor's prison because of those hospital bills because i hadn't paid them yet go to sleep meredith You're itchy. Oh, she needs her oils, please. Where are they? Um, in the kitchen next to the eggs on the counter. Yes, you can safely store eggs on the counter from your own chickens as long as you don't wash them. They're good for about two, three months on the counter at room temperature. I promise. Food safety. They're from my chickens. <laughs> They're not from the store. Um, Daddy's going to get your... Oh, the coconut too, honey. The coconut oil. And one of those big bandages, she picked up a, a rash, and it's it's totally like, it's not contagious or anything. She's just itchy. Uh, stop scratching it. Stop scratching it. Parenting, it never stops. Ever, 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 ever. And I love it so much. Um, I was worried they were going to haul me away to debtor's prison. And I knew in my mind, of mine, in my heart of hearts, that debtor's prison wasn't real. I knew. I mean, it is in some places, but it's not here. I knew that, and I was worried, laying there, that they were coming to find me and haul me away to debtor's prison because of those hospital bills. Okay? It was rough. The throes of anxiety. I'm so far past that now. But let me tell you, it's been some dark days getting here. Not until I learned how to renew my mind. Stop kicking the baby. Move your feet away from her. Thank you. Until I learned how to do that, I could not get out of that hole of anxiety. I couldn't. I am today in a place I never even imagined possible. I didn't know that it was possible for people to not worry about every aspect of their life. You know, me back then trying to worry about, you know, the things of today that are going on. I don't think I would have ever left the house. I think I would have just been a depressed mess. But the renewing of your mind and making of a new wineskin for your mind can get you there. God needs you to put in that work, though. He needs you to. And if you don't, how can you expect him to uphold his part of the deal? <laughs> Get your dose of common sense with the nightly news. Oh my God, if we don't do something by 2030, you know, the world's going to blow up, you know, whatever the case, the climate change is going to destroy the world, right? And it's kind of funny too because um, in 2035, California says you can't buy gas powered vehicles. Well, if the world's supposed to end, you know, from a climate change thing in 2030, how, you know, you've got to initiate owning electric power vehicles in California 2035, five years after these idiots claim that the world's going to get the story about how the earth works, you know, science, whatever. You could be some kind of a lunatic. Dumbass. Okay? The nightly news, just what the doctor ordered. Only on truthradioshow.com. Um, you can't. How many times did he have a covenant with his people Israel and they stopped obeying him and stopped following the feast and stopped putting in the due diligence and their work to serve him? And he said, because you have done this, here is your punishment. You know, I mean, they got sent away into exile, guys. Because they didn't listen. It, I mean, it is past that. They weren't just not obeying. They were purposefully disobeying. They weren't just ignoring it and doing nothing. They were doing the exact opposite. Oh, you found it. They were doing the exact opposite. Um, the next verse is 2 Corinthians 10, 4 through 5. I thought that said 45. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God 
bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. That went to six, but I needed that one. Um, but it's that verse tells you that this is spiritual war. It is. It's spiritual war. And the weapons of our warfare are not made of the world. They're not made from the world. And the only thing we can do is rest in the knowledge of God and let that rest in his knowledge renew our minds and take every single one of our thoughts captive for him. Now, um, I want to move on. I have one verse for strength. Um, but, you know, I'm sure there's more. But this one kind of hit home so well. I just kinda, I left it at that. It's Isaiah 40, 31. I should have had these marked, but I was asleep until 10 minutes before I got in front of this camera. Um, Isaiah 40, 31. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. And see... This is telling you how, and this is telling you the product of doing it, all in one verse. Wait on the Lord to renew your strength. Wait on him. Have patience. The only way to be strong in this world is to seem weak to the world. That's a t-shirt. The only way to be strong in this world is to seem weak to the world. Um... Yeah, go right to go left, like the Cars movie. <laughs> um, wait on him for strength. And does that mean let me sit in this chair until he decides to make me feel like Samson where I tear down the pillars? No, it doesn't. It means being patient with him, being patient in his plan because strength is not in your muscles and what you lift Strength is in your endurance to keep running this race when it looks like the enemy is winning the battle because he is winning some battles. He's not going to win the war. So Abraham is a great example of that. God uh -huh. said, get you, get you up, take your family, and go where I tell you. Abraham said, where are we going? God said, you'll see when we get there. Yep. And he waited on him. Yeah. And, and he his had plan. to go. And I mean, look how much stuff happened in between then and when he got there. Exactly. I mean, gosh, it, it, it probably, I mean, who's to say Abraham didn't think while he was out wandering, like, are we ever going to get anywhere? You know, what, what happens if my well, family gets that, eaten by a wildebeest? What about everybody else who didn't hear from God? Like, Abram, what, what the heck, are, where, where the heck are we going? Yeah. Well, God said he's going to take us somewhere. Like Noah's family when he Did just started he building a boat. where? Yeah, Noah yeah. just started building and, and told him, like, I, I heard this. There's a great VeggieTales episode on that. His son, Shem, just got married in, in the VeggieTales. Um, and he was like, and he's singing a song about it. He was like, I've got plans, you know. And then Noah sings the song, well, God's got plans. He says, but your big plans are in my way. We'll build your boat, but let's do it another day. I mean, that's some lyrics straight from the song. Um, yeah. because I'm partial to the the Torah town, Noah and the Aardvark, myself. Oh yeah, we watched that just today because on on Shabbat we don't watch anything but Veggie Tales and Torah Town, so they can learn Bible lessons. Um, and we watched that one just today. They specifically requested it. They love Mr. That's, Shredder. Oh, it's really it's a really good episode. But shout out to John Hall who plays the uh, the King's assistant. Yeah, but it's like. When you see that, uh, they did such a good job in the VeggieTales episode um, reflecting how even if it's not something that happened, because we don't know. I mean, there might be some extra biblical texts that say how Noah's family felt about that situation. We don't know. They might not have been totally know, on board. The only thing I know from the extra biblical text is, you know, it says 120 years in one of Peter's epistles. Stop it, That Meredith. was how long Noah preached. Uh -huh. It took him five years to build the ark. Yeah, I mean, can you imagine how they felt for five years as people made fun of them? Five years! Where they, 
I mean, everybody was like, well, they're crazy. Right, but how many Because Noah and the Aardvark taught me that it had never rained before that. Yeah. Which was daunting to me at first. I was like, it never rained? Yeah, you never see I rain. I knew stuff come up from the ground. You never see rain until... But I didn't know it never came down. Until Genesis chapter 7 is the first time rain is ever mentioned. Gosh. So, but how many times do people say, you guys are crazy. You guys, I mean, we have a book on how to build solar panels. Oh, yeah. We have uh, things... No. Stop. No. We have put it back on. Things for it's the coconut oil. It won't stick. You didn't put I, the you I put. I tried to tell you that it's the her that her you, that spot is four times the size of that bandage. Yes, I know. But she likes it over the itchy spot. You put the coconut oil only on that part of the bandage, and then you stick the bandage. You didn't say that. I so thought it was I common it, sense. That was my problem then. But I, no, sorry. I, well, but it was not common sense because you said to put it on the places she was itching, and she's itching from here all the way down to her rib cage. I know. I so look at it every I day. Put the oils. You put the teeth. Yes, way. you put the oils all over it. You put the coconut oil only on the bandage so that it doesn't cause it to slide off. Oh, but you didn't. But I didn't have a bandage until after I did that. I apologize then. I'm too, I was too it's tired. It's all good. I'm just, I, that was what I was trying to say earlier. Um, anyways, so anyway, sorry, parenting never stops. Um, but yeah, I mean, imagine how they felt uh, because Noah was the only one that heard this from right. God. Well, and that's what I'm saying is it's something that most people who are prepping now. Yeah, they look crazy to the world. Oh, I yeah. have a seed stash so big, Granted, y'all. they look a little bit less crazy now. Oh, yeah. I have but, a seed stash so big it would blow your mind. But didn't you mind. just say you were talking about somebody who was talking about all this stuff at their church? And people just looked at them with like... It was the same eyes. person who was over here the yeah, other day about the bread. Saying. That's what and, I'm saying. And, and she was like, you know, she's still in the anxiety phase that I was, you know, she's years ago. She's just starting to wake up. Yeah. She, I, she just gets, she's like, Sarah, I'm starting to question everything. The church, you know, is the government really trying to help us? All these things. She said, I don't want to depend on anybody for my food anymore. I opened up my seed stash. You know, that is what I have for my family. That's it. That's what I've got. And I opened it up and I was like, look, here, here's some starter seeds. She said she immediately left and felt better. I'm not tooting my own horn. I'm showing you how God tells us to be. I know God will provide for me regardless of my stash. I could lose it all tomorrow. All my chickens could die tonight from a coyote attack. My seeds could mold in the package unexpectedly, and I have nothing. There was I've a dead coyote in the middle of 64 the other day. Ooh. Um, uh, yeah, because my stuff is not predator-proof. I'm relying on those 13 dogs back there, that, that them, them hunting I dogs. I Hank. Yeah. Hank is a beast, and I love him. He's, a, he's pound, a gentle he's giant. He's an 80-pound hound dog. Yeah, he's a walker hound. Um, But he's a gentle giant, but when you hear him bark, you wouldn't know that. And... I love him. I love him. Yeah, he's um, he's our newest adoptee. He's two years old. He needed a home, and he is Titus's brother now. And I love him. And he doesn't realize that he is eighty pounds and can't quite fit on the couch and snuggle me while I'm reading in the mornings. But we're oh, working yeah. on it. My mom and dad were here earlier, <laughs> and uh, Hank hopped right up on my dad. My dad said, "Whoa, wait, what? What you doing?" <laughs> he figured out how to fit that time though. Yeah, that um, was funny. But I, I could lose all my stuff tomorrow. But I know I've done my due diligence and what he asked me to do and to be prepared and that he takes care of the rest. Because, I mean, Elijah was in a cave with nothing and he fed him. I know he has the ability to feed my family with absolutely nothing plant, with absolutely nothing done. But he asks me and he um, says, you know, be prepared and prepare what, for your family. Provide that's what for we them. were talking about the other day is the key is, and this is why, unfortunately, a lot of people in the church, if they don't wake up, are going to miss it because God will provide everything you need. Oh, yeah. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all this shall be added unto you. Yeah. As long as you're obedient, God will make sure you see the rest. But part of being obedient is if you're able, trying to prepare for what you can. Is that on? No, she's good. Okay. Um, but the fact that I was able to provide for another one of his people that he knew was struggling right then with anxiety and fear and make it a little bit better 
with that provision, he wanted me to do it, and I would do it a hundred times over. Yeah. Um, and so, do you want me to share the story about the cleansing the household? You're going to do that on the next one for soul. Oh, gotcha. Oh, yeah. I didn't know we were still on mind. No, we're done with mind. We just did strength. Now we're on soul. Gotcha. Okay. Um, I'm going to just read a couple of these, and I'm going to tell you what the other ones are because we're getting super late, and I'm tired. Yeah, I'd say we go about uh, – we got about another nine minutes, and that will bring us right to an hour and a half. Okay. Um, Psalm 5110. That's a good one. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. I actually have the same verse under heart because it, it mentions both heart and spirit. But, um,. This is talking about renewing your... It specifically says, renew a steadfast spirit. So, hun, uh, dictionary.com us real quick with steadfast so that we can give a word-for-word definition, not just what I'm about to tell them in my redneckified version of what steadfast means. Um, because our spirit, that's where everything starts. The first umption you have to get saved is in your spirit. Why? Because we are all his children, and he created us, and there is always something in us that wants to be with him. We try to fill it with the world because of sin nature, but we can never feel fulfilled unless it's him. We try to do it through jobs. We try to do it through money, fast cars. Some people try to do it through food or, you know, having, you know, a hundred animals or alcohol or drugs or a million different sexual partners. You know, we try to fulfill that what oh i thought we had kicked out or something i was about to cry oh not on our oh we're not on the internet um sorry there was a sound in my ear from him doing that um we try to fulfill that with everything but until we do it with god it'll never feel full ever and until we fill up our spirit with him, it can't flow out into the rest of us. Our body, our strength, our mind, our hearts. It can't get there until it's in our soul. The inkling, the umption is there. But we have to renew it with a steadfast spirit with his help for it to flow everywhere else in the body. You got that definition? Okay. I'm going to go ahead and flip to the next verse of soul. Yeah, that'll work. We can't, I can't hear you in my ears. It's because I had my mic muted because I'm over here humming a song to help concentrate. Ah, but don't be so muted when you say Steadfastness, according to Webster's 1828 Dictionary, means firmness of standing fixedness in place second definition is f definition is firmness of mind or purpose fixedness in principle constancy resolution as the steadfastness of faith he adhered to his opinions with steadfastness and now be my hype man what should we be fixed and firm in jesus amen he did it for me that time y'all give him a round of applause i love you um, but that is how we do it. That is, this one, soul, I would say is, it's the most important because this, everything else is just having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. If it's not in your soul and your spirit and you feel it, then everything else is just, it's just, it's kind of like mealy mouthing it, like. You know, you're saying it, you're doing it, but you're not feeling it. It's only part of you cooperating. So be affixed, be steadfast. Pray for a steadfast spirit in him. Like when we did um, uh, More Undignified Than This and we read the uh, lyrics to Come Thou Fount. The last, the last part, I don't think we ever read the last part, but it says, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. 
Yeah, I was listening to that on uh, my way to, to Elizabeth today. City today. Mm. I listened to it today too. Um, but before that is, um, I'm trying to think. It's um, so to grace, how great a debtor. Daily, I'm constrained to be. Mm-hmm. Fix my heart, Lord, like a fetter. Um. Bi- and then bind it says, my heart, Lord, as a fetter. Oh gosh, it's so early. Because that's my favorite part. Because it makes it clear mm-hmm. that you are a slave. Yeah, but the part I'm getting to is bind my wandering heart to Thee. Like they're asking, bind my heart to You, just like this is saying, renewing a steadfast spirit. Let yeah, me think it, on nothing it talks but about how you're prone my to love wander. for You. I mean, yeah. And we are because we're flesh. But but because we don't sing songs like that in church anymore, people don't realize that. And they just think, and I personally blame a lot of this on the doctrine of the perseverance of the saints. Exactly. Which is the stupidest thing in the world. It makes absolutely no sense. How does perseverance of the saints mean that once you're saved, you're always saved? Because the word persevere What did they have to persevere against? Going. Exactly. But that was what it says, prone to wonder. Lord, I feel it. Yeah, I, and I that's, feel it that's, every day. That's not wander with an O. That's wander with an A. Wander, yeah. Like you're walking off. Prone to leave the God I love. Right. Your spirit so knows you love Think of it him. as you're a child. Mm-hmm. All right, Meredith is a great example. When we go to the store, Meredith has to wear the leash because Meredith will just run off. Yeah, I mean, she has to wear the backpack leash. And I get a lot of slack for that, but, I mean, she's an autistic ADHD child. What do you want me to do, put her in danger? I mean, my three-year-old, I mean, she's three. Not to mention the fact that the she stores around here, people will literally walk up in broad daylight and just take your child. No, she, they won't because they will be gone. I'm not saying take your child, but I've seen them do it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I've seen them, and that's exactly why. I love my child more than I love, as much as I love my dogs, I love my child 10 billion times more. Why wouldn't I protect them as much as I would a dog? Mm-hmm. I mean... We're not going to debate. At least the dog um, has teeth to bite the person that's trying to take them. I mean, so does Meredith, but <laughs> oh, yeah, well, she will too. Um, that's a sassy. She is. A, she is a sassy little child. I love her. Okay, so Ephesians four twenty three is where we're going next. Um, but I'm going to back up some again for context. But you have not so learned Christ, if indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him. As the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning your former conduct, the old man which grows corrupt according to deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. I think this one was supposed to be in her mind, but it's still a renewal. Um, It's so important. Put off the old man was the words that kind of really drew me when I was writing these down um because that's what it is your old man is your old wineskin well see because that's so funny because you know one of the songs that has been stuck in my mind for the past few days and i've been listening to it what have you ever heard the song carry me by jars of clay no carry me i'm just a dead man lying on the carpet can't find a heartbeat make me free don't want to be an old man heard of the old one off with the old plan great song i really have never heard that it's like really old so i used to listen to that when i was in like seventh grade in the youth group that i was at in smithfield Mm mm-hmm and so I won. So my my youth director, she always used to have contests, and whoever like did the well in the contest that always had to do with like Bible stuff, got a free CD. Ooh. So I would always walk away like I had jars of clay, KJ five two, you name it, I had it all. Jars of clay, they're the ones that does um, the song Flood. Oh yeah, Flood is my song, man. Yeah, I, I was listening repeat, to that too. But um, I think that's all I've ever heard by them. No, they've got some great songs. They got. They even got a version of "Be Thou My Vision." I'm not Why like. Why can't I remember where the Book of Titus is? The Book of Titus is right. Uh, uh, it's either right before, or right after uh, it, Philemon. Timothy. It's right after Timothy. Yeah, right that's what it Philemon. is, and right before Philemon. Philemon. And my old pastor, when I was a little girl, used to call it Philemon. I was like, he sounds Joe Bacon. I Philemon. <laughs> it's so early in the morning. Um, 
better than mine, I was going to say. Because like, I knew somebody who called it Philemon, and I wouldn't do it because it sounded too much like Digimon. <laughs> Titus uh, 3 5. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior. Now that is talking about the renewing of the Holy Spirit. This is renewing of him for us making him new and fresh to us helping us feel connected to god i'm telling you guys it's riddled all over the bible and i don't know how i've never heard a daggone message on this all the time i've been in church because this doesn't make people feel good it makes them feel broken it makes them feel broken and you are i want to tell you right now you're broken but well, you see, are beautifully is, broken you are broken because like what is uh it, the Bible says that, you know, there's that. So is it in, in the book of Jeremiah that talks about the broken vessels? Uh-huh. Is that, um, that's the one where he takes the pot and he has to. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But that, because the metaphor was that, that that was Israel. They were broken vessels. They weren't good for anything. And until you accept the fact that you're broken and you're good for nothing, God, there's nothing God can do with you. Amen. Because he needs you to, he needs you to, to acknowledge your that you need so he him. he can fix you. Yeah. Jesus said he came to set the captives free. But first you have to admit that you're a captive. Because that was what was wrong with the old generation when they tried to go into the promised land. Right. They were they were literally longing for Egypt. And which, of course, every time I hear that now, all I can think of is pa grape. We are what? the grapes of wrath. I was, well, we'll not what I was. I was talking breath. about in uh, Josh and the Big Wall. <laughs> I know, but every time I think Paul Grape, I did think the grapes of wrath. So. It's the grapes of math now. Yes, because they're nice. So, but yeah, so, I mean, that, that, I mean, my brain just broke. Um, it's all right. Um, but, you know, it just, that was what was wrong with them was they didn't want, they, they would rather have been slaves in Egypt than free men in the wilderness. Mm -hmm. And I think we have the same problems because every time I go outside and it's like a hundred degrees, I just think to myself, I, I just, I'm like, God, please don't ever let us actually be in the wilderness because I can't handle it. Which is, uh, right now is where I want you to fit in your story. Um, so he told me this story the other day and it kind of fit perfectly with what I want to talk about next. The big thing that's not going to make people who aren't in the realization of the true faith very happy to hear. Um, but it kind of, it goes along with this. Um, and it was a story he told me about a customer's house he was at the other day. Yeah. So, so I, uh, you. so basically just to give you guys a little background, I mentioned this a couple of times, um, uh, I don't know what happened in between August and September, but they completely rechanged everything. And rechanged, August, changed, yeah, kind of yeah, because they that. had just changed some things, and they then they completely again, rechanged them. Oh, they changed them again. They rechanged them. There's no rechange. They rechanged. They them. changed them again. They rechanged. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not bending on. But this. re means again. So why don't you just say it pol uh, politically correct? Uh, why don't you work on your mind scan over there? PC, dude. <laughs> um. So um. anyway. Um, they changed things around and I found out on August 31st, I went to go look at my day for September 1st, just to kind of prepare myself for what I was going to do. And I started noticing stops that were not on my route. And so I called my boss and I was like, Hey, I think there's been a mistake. I've got all these stops. He was like, no, um, James, the guy that worked up there, he was like, he moved back to Florida and we don't have anybody to run that area. So he said that uh, the big boss changed everything around and I'd be working um, Elizabeth City, which is about two hours from where I live. Um, and I told Sarah, I was like, well, it's not going to be that bad because I know God's got me up here for a reason. Yeah. And I think I found out at least what one of those was because I went to a house, introduced myself. I don't even remember how it came up, but we started talking about demons and how the lady had had demons manifest to her. And she had let in a couple of friends that had been on drugs real bad for years. And the demons started talking to her while they were there. And then um, she started talking about um, how her husband had uh, would wake up in the middle of the night and he couldn't move or speak. And then when he was finally let go, he'd run downstairs and he'd try his hardest. He couldn't remember the Lord's Prayer and he was desperate. 
So he'd look it up on his phone and just pace and then fall asleep on the couch. She said, I don't know what it is about that couch, but there's something about it. I haven't figured out what that was yet, but we went outside. I was about to put my stuff up to leave, and we got to talking about somehow we got on the subject of elemental spirits. Mm -hmm. And she was like, yeah, I'm not sure what it is. And I look over in the corner, there's a sandstone gargoyle. Yeah. And I'm like the kind of person that, like, this is easy for me to just sit here and tell everybody. I was like, but in... And when it's face to face, I don't want to come across as abrasive as I know that I probably do on here sometimes. Because I'm here, at least I'm talking to people that are familiar with me. Out there, these people don't know me. So I was like, well, I told her, I was like, well, I said, that might be part of your problem. And I said, and I have no right to tell you what to do with your stuff. This is your house, your stuff. So, I don't have any right to tell you what you should and shouldn't do. I was like, but I do know that thing right there. That said, those spirits will latch onto that thing. And she was like, what is it? I was like, that's a gargoyle. And they're used in ancient cathedrals, which was adopted by paganism. Because they were supposed to, adopted by Christianity from paganism. And they're supposed to ward off evil spirits. But in reality, what they do is they, the evil spirits latch onto them. And she was like, she was like, no, I don't mind getting rid of it at all. She said, my kids, they're terrified of it. And I was like, oh, yeah, that's definitely it. Yeah. And so I told her, I was like, look, I'll take it off your hands. I'll make sure, you know, it's gone. It gets destroyed. Um, so I put it in the back of my truck. And I prayed over it. I told her, I was like, look, these things get pissed off when you do this. So you need to be, like, prayed up. You need your family prayed up. And y'all have got to find these other things and get them out of your life. So, but I took that, and the whole time I'm in my truck driving off to my next stop where I ended up destroying it, um, there's a tightness on my chest. Now, what was crazy, and I told you this part, but what was crazy was I was going to throw it in the sound because I work by the beach. So, uh, like the sound that comes inland from the, from the islands, um, I, I work right on that and I was going to throw it in there, but, um, that stop ended up canceling. So I went to a different one, destroyed it. And then I look up and there's one that's four feet taller staring at me at this house up on a pole. Mm -hmm. Kid you not this, this one that I destroyed was this big. The other one was, I kid you not about that big. And it's just staring at me. Mm. And I didn't see it when I pulled up because I had been there for 10 minutes by the time I got the thing destroyed and threw it in the woods. So what the significance of that is, I, all I could think of was I started praying for the family because I got to thinking about the verse where they go and they wonder and they go find seven that are greater than them and they come back. Mm-hmm. And that was immediately what came to my mind. I was like, oh, my gosh. I was like, God, please help them. But that goes back to the preparing Mm-hmm. You know, pre- prepping the house because, and it goes back to prepping the temple because when these things get in, if you let them back in and you have those doorways, they're going to come back with a vengeance. Mm-hmm. And that was what I had seen from this, but I won't even be able to check in for another two months to find out what's going on. So y'all please keep that family, <laughs> excuse me, y'all please keep that family in your prayers. And um, I wanted him to fit that story in when we talked about this. When I heard it, it immediately, you know, God dropped it and said, that has to go in. Why? Because people forget this step of renewing their wineskins. They forget it. It's your house. It's the things that you put inside it. Okay, since we have come to the faith, you know, we have gotten rid of so much stuff that I looked at so innocently before. Mm Mm-hmm. There was one night I was sleeping and um, I woke up and there's just like this spinning ball floating through my room and I couldn't breathe. I couldn't move. All I could do was like my children were in the bed. I was putting my arms over him. He was he was in the bathroom at the time and I started calling for him and immediately like he he opened the door because he was he was coming out anyway and the thing moves into one of my pictures and stays there and I said what was that and he said and I told him what it looked like he said okay where is it I said it went it, it went into that picture and it's gone I thought I was dreaming it was a picture it was a picture of Kylo Ren guys 
There's a picture of Kylo Ren from Star Wars that he got for his birthday one year. Yeah, because I'm, I'm a big Star Wars fan. Yeah. But for some reason, whatever the reason was, something had latched onto it. And he took it and chucked it outside. And the next day, we, we got rid of it. We took well, it see, off. see, because there was the Kylo Ren picture. But a couple of days before that, I had seen one. Yeah. And it's because I went and I did that treatment on that house where there was all those old books. And I just, like, you know me, when I get around books, that's like a treasure trove. Yeah. I found this book from the 1850s, I think, and it was called Solar Biology. Mm -hmm. Now, as I did more research into solar biology, it was basically the start of New Age. And what it was was it by, it was uh, it, it, it was a fusion of modern science and philosophy with the Zodiac. Mm. And so I burnt that book, and yeah. immediately that one went away. So there was that one. Um, there was also the time that I woke up in the middle of the night. There was a four-year-old with blood coming out of her eyes standing over me. Oh, God. You never told me that. Help me, Jesus, please. That was that was over a year ago. Oh, God. So I, I like still that. haven't figured out what set that one off. Um, but I haven't seen it since, and we've gotten rid of some stuff since then. But my Dungeons & Dragons game was still in the house at that time, and I didn't know it. Oh, yeah. So. We got rid of that thing. Um, yeah. we've gotten rid of a lot of DVDs. I mean, just with people in it that we know are tied to the occult. Like, I mean, so, Johnny yeah. Depp, James Johnny Franco, Depp. Will Ferrell. I was a big James Franco fan for years, so I had all his movies. Um, because I'm a I'm a movie buff. Like, I don't like just sit down and watch them all day. Yeah. But I do like to watch a good movie. Yeah. Um, but so we got rid of stuff like that. Um, there and, was some other stuff like even my illusion books. Yeah. I had to get rid of some of those um, because, like, I have – so, like, I love – like, when – it was – what has that been, like, five, six years ago now? I really got into studying, like, sleight of hand. Like, I'm really good at making coins and cards and it, stuff it like that. It was four years ago because it was but, when I was pregnant with Lydia. But I also had books on mental magic. Yeah. And I started learning how to make people do what I wanted them to do and then making it look like I was reading their minds. Yeah. And that one, that is actually, I'm convinced that is witchcraft. Yeah. We got rid of a bunch of witchcraft stuff, too, like Harry Potter movies and stuff yeah, like that. Yeah, I got that. rid of Harry Potter. I um, kept all my Lord of the Rings stuff. Yeah. Just because I, um, that I mean, one, I'm still, the jury's still out on that one. Okay. I'm still looking into I those. I told you, you lead this house. You lead us the right way, and now I have no problems. But that, that's the important thing that I'm telling you, that the stuff in your house, when you start renewing your spirit and you push the old out, it's going to try to find something in your house that's not clean and latch onto it and stay with you. Mm -hmm. And, and people elementals, think, well, elementals do latch on. So one of the things I learned from David Carrico is with an elemental spirit, you don't cast it out, you cast it off. Because it latches onto objects. So the movie Poltergeist yeah. is actually would be more apt to describe an elemental spirit. I, I don't watch movies like that. but I mean, um, I haven't seen Poltergeist in years. But, but it's they will find a way to stay with you. And you think, oh, well, I don't have things like y'all just talked about happening to me, so I must be okay. Let me ask you this. Do you have trouble sleeping? Let me ask you this. Do you uh, have trouble with depression? Anxiety. Are you constantly Stress. yawning? Yeah, constantly yawning. That's a thing, and I'm not sure why. Um, because because all right, I can tell you exactly what it is, okay. and this is gonna this this might make people uncomfortable. So, like the boy in the, your church mm -hmm. that got possessed by the demon Sabaton. Yeah, he. The reason he was constantly yawning yeah. is you got to think what is a demon. It's the disembodied spirit of a Nephilim giant, right? Mm -hmm. It yawns because it is trying to stretch your body because it's not designed to be in a body that small. Oh, that makes sense. Oh, God, So like remember that. the movie um, Split? Mm -hmm. Remember when the beast personality came out, how mm -hmm. his body physically changed form mm -hmm. and his muscles did that weird thing? Yeah, yeah it's like that. So um, to give you backstory, when he's talking about, um, I went to a church that, you know, that was one of the things that they they would they would cast out uh spirits when they presented themselves and there was this boy he was 17 at the time and about two weeks prior he had he he had issues with his parents and he had gotten really heavily into listening to death metal it was kind of a way to cope like he liked the adrenaline rush of all the noise and mm -hmm. it kind of helped him forget his stress um but the band when you go to their website 
you see things about how they praise someone called Sabaton. And, you know, when you do the research into that, you can go down that rabbit hole. But well, see, because what's interesting is the word Sabaton is the Greek word for Sabbath or week. Oh, gosh. So, yeah, that's definitely a devil's counterfeit right there. Yeah. The devil has a counterfeit for everything. But it's just like Black Sabbath, right? Yeah. So, Black I mean, it's Sabbath. the same thing. Yeah. Um, but he went to the front of the church one day because he was like, he had this urging and like, it almost like he was going to throw up and he went to the front of the church and immediately when he hit his knees, he started, he like, he was, he was fidgeting and he couldn't sit still. And my aunt, she is very sensitive to these things and she spotted him first and she called like some of the the elder women and men and prayer warriors of the church that she knew were prayed up and ready to handle this um and it was towards the end of the service so my job my job was to get the babies i got all the kids and all the babies out of the room she didn't want them near and i was to go in a room and i was to pray over them far away so that's what i did i just remember having car seats hanging from my arms and a line of little duckling toddlers following me i was like come on we got animal crackers like let's You've go always been a mama duck. <laughs> um and uh but once i came out once all the babies had been picked up and but they were still going and i didn't know it at that point i missed kind of the middle but he was on the ground he had a person holding down this arm a person holding down that arm two people on each leg and he had a person with two hands on his back to keep him from fighting right which and reminds like, me that what are they doing of the story with the madman yeah that they tried to put in fetters and chains mm -hmm. and he broke them off yeah i mean we're not dealing with a human here we're dealing with and i was like what are they doing to that guy i don't, I don't want to say his name but i was like what are they doing to him I thought, you know, that this, you know, because the spiritual, it wasn't all, it wasn't all cohesive to me. I was only 14. Um, but then I heard him growl like a beast, like he growled. That is a terrifying sound. And it was like this low guttural and I was scared. I remember pouring tears and I'm like, what is going on? But I could not watch. I could not see it. I couldn't go away because the anxiety in me needed to know where it ended. And um, my aunt was, you know, at his face, and she said, what is your name? And he, I was like, his name is, and then I said his name, like in my mind. And he said, my name is Sabaton, and I live here now. I said, what is going, like, so much fear. Mm -hmm. And she said, no, you don't. And she cast him out in the name of Jesus. And he said, I'm not leaving. She said, I command that you are in the name of Jesus. And like I said, he was writhing. All these people were on top of him. I mean, he was 17, but he was skinny. He was right. a little tiny kid. And he was throwing these grown men off of him, and they had to keep pinning him down. And this went on for another 10 minutes or so. And finally, it's like he fell asleep. It's, it's like he just he just fell asleep. He laid his head on the ground. He shut his eyes. Everybody moved off of him. But I could see him breathing. And it wasn't two minutes later. He was up. And they said, and my aunt said, are you okay? How you feel? He said, I'm hungry. Like, just like it was a normal day. And he just, he says, I'll see y'all next week. Bye. I said, I never wanted to come back here in my life. Um... It was a scary experience for me, but it was through the music that he was listening to, even though he was, he was, you know, in church, you know, and he, I was just told to give this to you. right now, yeah. I don't know when you can't believe something out of that. Oh gosh. Yeah. Cause this had a lot of stuff in it about that. This, this book changed my world. Um, Because that'll teach to, people how to get their house in order. Yeah, it will. And I'm going to um, read the things that... Uh, okay, yeah. That's that's where he wants me. Um, it was through the music he was listening to, he didn't cleanse his house. And he was 17. How did he know how? And his parents weren't saved. Um, right, but it goes back to what Proverbs says. Train he, your child up in the way that he should go, and when he's older, he shall not depart from it. Yeah, like... It was just like it was so, 
it was so weird and foreign to me because it was like it was starting and it was so intense and it was over. But my aunt, who was prayed up every day and she had done the work to cleanse her household, um, she knew that declaring it in the name of Jesus, not her power, and, and but his power to do it. A little bit of background without getting into her stuff. Yeah. But just to say the reason she was so good at spotting these is because she's dealt with them. She has dealt personally. with them on a personal level since she was born. I mean, with her, I mean, the people who are supposed to be keeping her safe, her own mother and father, I yeah, mean. Yeah, that's a heartbreaking story. She can tell you some, and she knows what they have look her like. as a guest sometime. Oh, she would she's love willing. it. Um, but she knows what they look like. And that's why she was their, her, their, their resident go-to person when this kind of thing happened. And apparently it happened a lot. I just, you know, I haven't been going to the church super long, maybe like a year and a half at the time. Right. And um, and the reason I say about that bringing her on is because she's another one that's just starting to wake up. Yeah, she's starting to wake like, up to like the feast, and so she's always been in God's will, but she didn't know where to go from there. It's like she didn't have any direction because, like I said, she didn't have any parents. I mean, right. so like it's weird. Like I, she's been teaching me all well, these not years. Not that, but in the, her biggest times of need, yeah, the people that claim to be the followers of Christ have abandoned her. Oh yeah, and that was rough. But, like, she's been pouring into me God's will all these years and training me up. And now I can turn around and pour into her. And she's like, you're teaching me so much. And I love it. It's I'm, because of the prophecy in Joel. Yeah. Uh, the young men. Mm. Well, yeah, I mean, that's part of it. But isn't that uh, Joel also the one that talks about the young teaching the old? I think so, yeah. Uh, there's somewhere. I can't remember where it is. but um. So... This is where he wants but, me with um, this. While you're finding so, that, did you find it? Yeah. Okay, um, then go ahead. So, and and that's like the thing with the holidays. The holidays of this world are old wineskins. The reason you don't feel God, you feel yeah. the spirit of Christmas, mm -hmm. and you feel the spirit of the holidays. It's not God. You well, can't. it reminds me of the old line from Sanford and Son. What? When uh, Aunt Esther comes, and ah. Uh, you know, uh, Fred's just giving her, grilling her, giving her a hard time. She was like, you can't get me now, Fred. I've got the spirit of Christmas. He said, yes, and the face of Halloween. <laughs> oh, yeah, I remember that. Because, but, you're like, you just shake that off as, like, it's an insult. But, no, it's the same thing. Yeah. It's literally the spirit of Christmas has the face of Halloween. Oh, yeah. Because, and, guys, if you haven't done it yet, if uh, you haven't listened to the uh, tearing down the High Places episode that was our season finale for our first season of the podcast, you should. Because it's all about the casting down imaginations and what Paul meant when he said that uh, we are, our weapons are not carnal but mighty to the pulling down of strongholds because those strongholds are those high places. It says every high thing that exalteth itself above Christ, right? Yeah. So we went through the Old Testament and looked at all the times that the uh, kings would tear down the high places yeah. and how they didn't tear them all down, which are, I look at as today you have people that are standing up for things like they're tearing down the high places of so social justice and they're tearing down the high places of all this other stuff that's getting in the church and things like that. They may have not, it's just like King, was it Josiah, I think? That was known for, uh, he tore a lot of them down, but he didn't get all of them. And that's Christmas, Easter, all of those, those are those last high, those are those last high places. And we went through, and we went to a witch's website and showed, uh, she went through and explained what every decoration on a Yule tree means and what spirits it binds. Yeah, and you because have that people in your put house. These, people put these in their house. And everybody says, oh, well, Jeremiah 10, that's not about the Christmas tree, but it absolutely is. It was, Of course it wasn't called a Christmas tree then. Like, there was no people Christmas. People that are saying that are being ridiculous. Yeah. Um, but the reality is, is uh, especially if you watch Truth or Tradition by that Jim Staley did, yeah. he does a great job of showing that these trees were in temples all the way back even into ancient Egypt. Mm. And, um, But, I mean, but, that's the biggest thing. You're trying to renew your wineskin, and you're trying to fit him in the box of Christmas and Valentine's Day and uh, Easter and all these things. He doesn't want to be there. He will not be there. You feel a disconnect from God. They say depression right. is highest during the holidays. Of course. But because and, God and is farthest from his people, and he wants to be with us. Deuteronomy 28, 
if you obey me, I will bless you in all these things. But if you don't, I will, I will, cur- there will be curses. Mm-hmm. And one of those curses is the, the iniquity that you have to bear. Exactly. And God says specifically, Moses told them in Deuteronomy chapter 12, when you go into the land that the Lord gives you, do not look at the way the heathen worships their God and say, I will worship God in this way. Yeah, exactly. But and that's, that's how exactly what, what we're done. doing. Um, I mean, you can't fit him into the box of those holidays and call yourself clean. You can't. You can't. I mean, well, see, I don't know why you. I, I don't know anymore why you would want for to. In Israel, they use sheepskin for wines because you know sheep are a clean animal. Yeah. But most other countries, do you know what they used for wineskins? Wasn't it pigskin? Pigskin. That's why I want to do that. Um, I'm going to name drop them. Dry Farm Wines. Um, they are completely vegan. They, not a sponsor, by the way. Not a sponsor. It's just I, uh, I've chosen to eliminate food dyes for my family, and I like to cook with wine, and I like to drink wine every now and then. I'm not really a big drinker, but I like the antioxidants it gives me. But you know if you buy wine from the store, because the FDA and the wonderfulness that they are, they don't require wine makers to list the ingredients on the bottle. And they have added food dyes they have added synthetic yeast they are gmo the grapes are sprayed with um pesticides and they are irrigated now what happens when you irrigate uh grapes is you actually push more sugar into the grapes so when you make them into wine it has a higher alcohol content so dry farm wines it means they only water it with the rain that comes out of the sky and i'm you know and we we used to drink kosher wines and things like that but the reality is is those are blessed over by rabbis i got convicted okay we don't. were we were making a, a a rack a leg of lamb that i got from the store and i've been buying it all the time but i finally looked in the corner of the packaging one day and it said that it was halal and i was like oh and I was like, what am I supposed to do with that information? And, you know, it was kind of God, like God said, look it up. So I did. I looked up the requirements for making something halal. And basically, it's a prayer that they have to have said over it in order to bless it for the God of Islam, which people think is the same as ours, but it's not. No, Allah is a moon goddess. Yeah. like and You really do the study on it. So they have to say, you know, bless this in the name of Allah in the when they make something halal. And I was like, but what about what the Bible says about me not eating food that's been sacrificed right. to idols? Which is why, which is why we stopped with. And then he said, well, if we're like going to do that, we need to stop kosher too. And I was like, but why? And he said, because they pray over it in the name of their God, which is not. It's so not. It's not ours. When you really start, especially when you start looking at high level rabbis and how majority of them practice kabbalah yeah kabbalah doesn't i mean the bible tells us that when you reject jesus christ you have not the father yeah so we already know that they don't pray to the same god exactly but they can't have the kabbalah father because they don't have as jesus far as to say there's something called the ain sof and the ain sof is the being that created the god of the bible oh god he is the ineffable so when they talk about you can't say the ineffable name yeah they're not talking about yahweh uh-huh. they're talking about ain sof because he is the ineffable being. Gosh. So, um, yeah. But we, that, and um, I, that's like, then everybody's like, oh, that's a rabbit hole. Don't, don't go down that rabbit hole. Because but as that's, far as that's with, where people destroy themselves because they can't handle the information. As far as, with, yeah, especially if your wine skin isn't ready for it. I mean, my wine skin wasn't quite ready for that one. That was a lot. Um, but as far as kosher and halal stuff, um, I say, you know, use your own discernment and your own judgment. But really, I mean, the more I think on it and pray on it and meditate on it, you know, because I know a lot of people like me, you know, it's easy like with marshmallows because we don't eat pork because we know it's unclean. I have to buy special marshmallows that don't have the, the pork fat in them. And so it was easy to find them in the kosher section at, at Walmart. But they lit- they come from a company that prays over them to be kosher and i had to stop buying them like because so here's the other thing it's so they sacrifice will sacrifice to an idol they will label things because um according to rabbinic law mm-hmm. you can um it's a, it's not permissible to lie to a fellow jew right 
but you can lie to Gentiles if the situation calls for it. Wow. See? Um, I forgot what part of the Talmud, but I actually read that out of the Talmud. So, um, because I'm one of those geeks that if I hear something mentioned, I actually have to go find what part of the Talmud it came from and read it for myself. So, um, and I'm telling you, the Talmud, I mean, <clears throat> there's a reason they call it the Babylonian Talmud because it does nothing but bring confusion. All right. So. Um, guys, I'm going to wind this down because I've given you yeah. like a, 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 a brain dump of information here and I know it takes time to process. Look through your house is the biggest thing to start this journey on renewing your wineskin. Look through your house. Do you have any movies that depict people that you know are Satanists? Do you have any um, food in your house that was sacrificed to idols? Do you have any posters on your wall that have demonic picturings in the background that you may have never noticed? Yeah, and think about old stuff that you may have forgotten about. Because one of the things look for through me the closets. Because I uh, back uh, this is like ten years ago. I used to play Yu Gi Oh and Magic the Gathering. Yeah, Magic the Gathering has like literal like one of the things you have to do is mana. And a lot of people they hear manna, they think of the I'm thinking the, bread, the but, food from the Bible. Yeah, like, but what manna is is it's actually energy you have to sacrifice to gain magical power. Oh gosh, so, yeah, he had all um, those cards in in the in the shed. Yeah, and, and we like, couldn't figure and out like, why we weren't. Not only this, but I just told you the other day that I had the Egyptian god cards, uh -huh. Obelisk the Tormentor, the Winged Dragon of Ra. I had all of those. Yeah, because I mean they were. This is what I used to spend my time doing. If I had spare money, I'd go buy. A bunch of stuff and like play with my friends and i didn't i didn't know I, I mean my mom told me when i was a kid that this stuff came from the book of the dead and that, yeah. i mean she heard that from somebody else so she couldn't really explain it that well but now that you i understand have this information this stuff, children like logic well and i told you the other day because i passed that obelisk that was a civil war memorial yeah but i asked you i said why is it always an obelisk and i said because isn't it funny one of the egyptian god cards is called obelisk the tormentor mm-hmm so, but yeah, you got to I mean, get rid of this stuff. Guys. We couldn't figure out. I mean, we kept, we were at each other's throats. We were arguing. The children were going off on, uh, you know, it was like our house was full of strife. We went in the shed for something totally unrelated. And he was like, Hey, look at all these old cards I found. He was like, you know what? I bet that's our problem. Yeah. And he I got mean, rid of them that had, day. I even had Yu-Gi-Oh cards that were based off of the Knights of the Round Table. Yeah. And so I've got this book. Uh, I actually don't have it over here. I think it's still in. But I've got uh, David and Donna's book about the Luciferian transmutation. Yeah. That's King Arthur on the front, not Jesus. Mm. That's King Arthur's Last Supper. Mm. Because King Arthur is the Antichrist, essentially. Right. Um, I mean, and once you start studying Arthurian legend, the Holy Grail. I mean, yeah. you've seen the Da Vinci Code. Yeah. Yeah, that's what it's about. Yeah. It's them hiding the code that they were looking for the bloodline. The Merovingian bloodline that was supposedly descended from Jesus. I'm telling you. And that's a reason that Jesus never had kids. You need to watch some of Gary Wayne's stuff. I'm going to try to reach out to him Reverend in the Wayne, future Gary and Wayne? see if he'll be willing to come on to talk about some of this stuff. I, I say that every time. I can't help not to say it. Reverend <laughs> Wayne, Gary Wayne. What was it? Kimmy Schmidt? That was the unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt. Yeah. <laughs> Hello, this stupid, is Reverend Wayne, Gary Wayne. Dumb <laughs> so every time he says Gary Wayne, that's what I think of. Um... I don't want to leave y'all in the uh, in the in the abyss with the whole demon. I know we just kind of dropped the whole demon thing on you, but it's um, it's possible to be oppressed by a demon even if you can't be possessed because you were spiritually clean. Yeah. And that's and what I was talking about with the, the cards. Like we were being oppressed, and the demons were stirring up the spirits that they could get into. Oh, I, just I hit myself with my microphone. I was wondering what that sound was. Ow, that hurt. <laughs> uh, um, <laughs> they could latch on to something in on our property, so they were stirring up what right. they could but, for us. And here's the thing that people don't realize, um, and most of you guys listening probably do because you guys watch the Doctrine of Christ too, but one of the biggest myths in the church is, oh, you're a Christian, you can't be possessed by a demon. Well, yes, are they are they spiritually clean? Not in the church because they're still eating pork like they're well, told not to. You, and I'm not going to mention the pastor's name uh -huh. because he's a pretty well-known pastor. Uh -huh. But didn't you say Tammy cast a demon out of a very well-known... She well -known. did, right before he went on stage for a, for a sermon. And I've talked about him in the past. He I've gotten was in, in arguments with people because he was the one I told you about that did the... He did the, the sermon on 
the parable that Nathan told David about the the sheep. Mm-hmm. And the whole story point of that parable is David took something that didn't belong to him. Right. But this guy took it, and there's a part where the stranger comes, and then he takes the sheep. Yeah. He His sermon was called Beware the Stranger. He made that entire sermon about a character, a throwaway character that is in that. Yeah. Um, and made the entire sermon about it. I'll have to show it to you sometime because it is absolutely yeah, ridiculous. It will make you laugh. It is so bad. And then you'll <laughs> cry because you'll feel bad for laughing at it. Yeah, I mean, she showed up to, like, enjoy the sermon, like, to one of his live things, like, and she was in the background meeting him because, like, they, like, knew of each other. And right then, backstage, like, it was, like, the Jesus full of her and what was in him couldn't stand it, almost. Because if one thing, you know, she does not allow evil spirits near her. She prays over that heavily all the time because of what she's dealt with. Yeah. So if there's something in your house a demon can latch onto, it will. And it will stir up strife in your life. And if you're not spiritually clean, and the reason I said, everybody says, well, eating pork is not a sin. No, it's not. But there's a reason we're told not to eat it. Do you know why? it does defile you. It defiles you. Do you know why? Because it's you can get parasites from eating pork meat. Mm -hmm. Parasites are uncleanness, uncleanliness in your body. And when there is uncleanliness, there is sickness, and that's where demons can thrive. Right. You open up the door to allow it. I'm not saying it's all the time possible, but it is a possibility because it's part of being unclean. I mean, I'm still, you know, finding hidden pork and things to this day that I'm still consuming and have to get rid of. So nobody is perfect with that. But when we willingly make that choice to go against what God has asked us, that's where a demon's like, hmm, that's a little spot I can pick at. I can pick at that spot. Right, see, and this is what I tell people all the time. I'm like, look, God's law isn't designed to keep you in. It's designed to keep evil out. It's designed to keep things out. So I want to read from, um, this is uh, from Victims to Victors, and this book, it, it, it changed my world. Okay, I didn't realize a lot of the anxiety and stuff I was dealing with The guy I was dating for a super long time before me and Trey uh, got together, um, I was, you know, I was anxious and depressed, but I was on the outside. I was a very happy person. But when I was with him, I couldn't figure out why the happiness wasn't there anymore. I was just like this clingy and whiny, uh, needy little thing who I, I depended on him. I couldn't be without him or it was like I was, you know, I wasn't any sort of comfortable like I couldn't figure out why when I was with him it got worse so I thought it was because I needed more of him and he was pulling away so I got more clingy and he pulled away more but then when I pulled away he wanted to be clingy we were stuck to each other you know and we were I mean we were together physically I mean I'm not gonna deny that I have sins I have a past we all do um but when I read this book from victims to victors I realized that I was still holding on to his stuff because we had been intimate. His All of his stuff and his strife in him that the demons were tormenting, it was coming on to me. I was having to deal with all of my stuff plus all of his stuff. And when I read this book, it taught me the prayers to kind of release that bond from myself. And the world opened up. The world opened up because it was him and a a couple others that, you know, I had been with before Trey and I was still holding on to their stuff. You know, there was one, you know, that like I just said, he was dealing with his own internal strife and depression. Then there was one he was extremely um, arrogant and haughty and uh, prideful. He was a narcissist. He he was a big narc. I mean, he still is to this day. Um, He was a big narcissist. And he was the whole time we were together. And I had took on some of that too, where I hated narcissism so much because of the men already in my life that it caused me to lash out on any man who showed any amount of pride because I was taking on all his extra pride inside of me. I was already disgusted with myself. So I was like, they're the problem. And then there was one who, um, he was, he was a philanderer. He liked to break up people's relationships and, uh, you know, basically for fun to say that he could, um, even though he hadn't been physically with anybody before me, he he did. He liked to meddle. And because of that, I found myself taking on some of that, too. You know, like when there was people's happiness, it was almost like it made me mad because I couldn't be that happy. You know, 
I was jealous. I was taking on his jealousy. And this book taught me how to break all that off of me. And I'm so much of a better person for that. I didn't even know I was still dealing with it. So I want to read the dealing with demons part. Because again, if you're not being possessed, you could be oppressed. <coughs> this comes from page 93 of the book. It talks about the doors of demonization. Um, and even if you can't be, I mean, if you have these, you can be possessed. You are opening up the door. Uh, the first one is sexual sins. Like I just talked about. If you have been with people... Even if not fully, in some way you've been intimate with them, you can take on their stuff. And you have to pray that off of you. Transfer of spirits, which talks about you need to be careful about who lays hands on you and prays, like, in ministry. Because if they lay hands on you, they can transfer their spirits onto you. And so I think... They're like a Freemason or something. I think they do that far too freely in churches where they say, let's all lay hands on this person before they go on a mission trip. They do that far too freely. You don't know what stuff they're dealing with. Well, a lot of that Stretch is Stretch out your hands to them. Especially, like... Just pray to yourself. Especially in, like, the church we were in because mm -hmm. they said they believed in spiritual gifts, but they never showed any asp like any... Yeah actual evidence they don't want to deal did. with the spiritual side of anything because it's too deep it'll right. scare people but but see that's the thing if you can't deal with the spiritual side then you shouldn't do things mm -hmm. exactly because every action that you do has a ripple effect not only in this realm but in the unseen realm as well exactly and i would argue that the the ripples are amplified in that realm yeah it is they are um, the next area is child abuse, and it talks about whether or not children can be demon-possessed, and they can be. Um, the book tells you. I've seen it myself. Um, <clears throat> but if you've dealt with child abuse... I've heard of four-year-olds being possessed. It's the that's, most heartbreaking This stories. book talks about that. As a matter of fact, um, I think I heard it from David. Yeah. Uh, the next one is strong emotions and bitterness, anger, and there's there's sub under fo uh, number four... Strong emotions, bitterness, anger, rebellion, rejection, unforgiveness, fits of rage, and rage against God. All of these can open you up to being possessed by a demon. Yeah, because these, these, these entities, <clears throat> they, they feed off of this stuff. Yeah. That's why the Bible says be angry and sin not. Because our anger leads to, it's not the anger in and of itself that's wrong. And it leads to the uh, demonization. It's what you do because of the anger. It's how you act on it. Number five is occult practices. That one is self-explanatory. Number six is generational iniquity. Sometimes it is. Yeah. Well, Sometimes I mean. Sometimes it is. So yeah. like, like. People don't realize things. how small so occult practices we were can be. Watching that, um, remember we were watching that uh, Gen Z Bible translations? Yeah. And they were in the little like hipster restaurant that was in the storage unit. Uh -huh. And uh, he asked him. Yeah. He asked him what his Enneagram number was. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's witchcraft. Yeah. Or like but reading your horoscope. It's witchcraft that's been adopted by the church because it's basically a personality test, but the personality test acts like a horoscope. Right. Oh, well, you're this number, so you should eat these things. Or wear this color today to be happy. Yeah. So um, that's yeah. why I say, like, to everybody here, it probably is, but I always want to clarify that because I never know when new new listeners are going to pull this stuff up. Oh, yeah, definitely. And I just I don't want to assume that everybody knows. So, because um, I think I did that a little too much last week with the Romans thing. Yeah. I just think that I spoke too much to, no offense to you guys that are listening, but I spoke too much to my regular audience and didn't prepare enough for new people. Right. Um, the next one is generational iniquity. That's stuff that's been passed down um, from people before you. And... Um, which you know, can be all the things that she just listed. Yeah, can lead it to can that. be all the things because it's your sin nature. You're born like with their DNA and they change their DNA with these things yeah. and pass it on to you. That's why we're born into sin mm -hmm. because your DNA changes with your personality and then you pass it on. Um, curses and hexes. I, I've had people physically who have had pictures of me like, you know, how relatives like pass out pictures who have prayed curses over my life. Like, they have prayed for bad things to happen to me. And I didn't know about it until I was an adult. Because my aunt told me and that she had been renouncing it since she found out. Like, they prayed for bad things to happen to me all my life. And not just me. Like, my family, my sisters, you know. And my aunt told me. And she said, she said I didn't tell you because you were little. I don't want to scare you. She said, but I had been renouncing it. Um... And then demonized generation in society. This is just being in general society, conforming 
and trying to be like the world in the world and not of the world. Um, and then symptoms of demon possession, unusual physical strength, fits of rage, self mutilation, mixed signals on spiritual things and occult knowledge, voice change, transfer of spirits, occult powers, amnesia, and lost time. Which is what I was talking about when that boy got up. He didn't realize how long he had been there. Right. He he didn't even he didn't remember walking to the front of the church. It was like everything God that was in him squeezed him to the front because God knew his people were there and prepared to take over. Right. And then Not he didn't that, remember anything. But, and see, that's the thing. Like, you know, and I know it's terrifying when you think about stuff like this because the reality is we just don't in our cessationist culture that we live in because the majority of the churches around right. don't believe in spiritual gifts. We don't uh, fully understand this stuff, but the reality is we don't have to. Right. Because we serve the same God that made Enoch the judge of the fallen angels and pronounced their punishment to them. Yeah. And you know what happened? They were terrified. They quaked in fear of Enoch. Mm. And it's the same thing. And we're dealing with their offspring. Yeah. Because um, the reality is, is we serve the same God who took down the giant with the stone through a willing servant. All he needed was somebody who was willing to act. Mm -hmm. and, and he'll do the rest. That's what he needs from you when you renew your wineskin. It sounds daunting at first. But if you start making the steps and just do what we read in those verses... Even if you don't know how, you start and you try. God's grace fills in the gaps. That's what Jesus is for, to fill in the gaps, because we're not good enough. Yeah, We're so not good enough without I do, him. I do want to let people know that, um, I, at least for me, this this uh, the story that I shared with the statue, yeah. this is the first time I've ever dealt with anything like this. Oh, yeah. So... My life has um, been so spiritually dark that I think for a while I went spiritually dormant. But, like, so, like, deliverance, everything, I'm not good at that. But if there's anybody out here who is listening and this is, the, you've struggled with these things, you've had these things manifest, um, this book, Victim to Victors, you can find it at FOJCRadio.com. Can they see me right now? And, um, yeah, they can. And so Sarah's holding it up. Hold it closer to the camera. Good. Now the light shining on it. Angle it. Yeah, that's perfect. So that's Victim to Victors by David and Donna Carrico. You can find it on FOJCRadio.com. Now, they they do all sorts of deliverance ministry, and they will know so much more about ways that can help you. So much more. Um, and I mean, everything that I've learned, I've learned because of them, because the reality is the churches I grew up going to did not teach things like this. Um, and... If you are listening to our show and you have never listened to theirs, they do a weekly remnant gathering. You can find them all in the podcast section. They do so many different things, but deliverance is one of the things that they deal with. Get this book from them. And a link will be below in the show notes. Please take advantage of that. They're, all their resources are there to help you. Plug that in because I'm on call. One of my clients is being induced tonight. I need to make okay, sure that that's doesn't fine. die. So, um, that's that's all we have, guys. Um, I know it was kind of heavy there at the end, and it started out so light, but you know that's that's how it is with God. He he he. It once you get to dip your toe in, he he's like dive deep with me, and I love it. Uh, I really enjoyed being with you guys again. It's been so long since I've been in front of this camera. I'm still not any better at it than I was the first time, but I hope you enjoy it. I hope you learned something. Normally, this is the time I tell you what my next show is. I don't have it yet. God will tell me, and then I'll tell you. I think next week we are going to follow up with more of the Todd Friel on the mandated Vs. Oh, yeah. Because there's... We barely got to talk about any of the, uh, we got to talk about the pinwheels thing. Yeah. But there's so much more. That was an hour show. Yeah. And then it had two follow-ups. Yeah. Well, that's because, your stuff. I'm talking about in a month when it's yeah, my Yeah, so I'm just letting people know that giving them a heads up, <laughs> we'll probably talk about more of that next week. Yeah, and then, you know, when I know, I'll get him to announce on one of his what's going on. But stuff is stirring in the spirit realm. Be prayed up and renew your mind skin. Have a good day. <laughs>
<laughs> y'all enjoy the rest of your evening. I might see some of y'all in the Now You See TV chat after this. So I will see you guys later. Have a wonderful night, and we will see you next week on Course Correction Radio. Bye. Y'all take care. <laughs>